uh, or heard from me for like a week. I do apologize. I actually, uh, I think I ate some some food that I'm allergic to, and I had a rash, and that's also why I'm not wearing a hat. And I just wanted to let you guys know that that's why I have my my bald head showing, and I had to take. I had to take uh, some medicine that made me very loopy, and I didn't want to make any videos on my loopy meds because then you guys would have lots of blackmail video footage of me all over the internet because you'd be like, look, here's Nathan being a weirdo. Like, that never happens. You know what I'm saying? Okay. We're good? Yes. And and uh, in honor of No Hat Wednesday today, yes. no I am not Wednesday. wearing a hat either. And this is like uh, old times. Oh. When we first started the EBRT, we didn't have those snazzy hats yet because you wonderful people haven't made them yet. And yeah, so uh, here we are, hatless. But yes. it's kind of nice because it's always kind of warm and I'm feeling more cool this way. I feel free. I feel like my head is <laughs> aerodynamic and free. Okay, so we got everybody logged on. You guys know that today we are reading Ezekiel. Uh, it's actually Ezekiel. Um, and everybody seems extremely excited for this book, rightfully so. Oh, yeah. Um, this book is I something guess. else, folks. Isn't it something else, ladies and germs? Yes, it is. Alex gave Alex gives me one of the best sentences when we, when we always start a new book. And it, it pretty much has been like for almost every book. And he goes, you know, I thought the last book was my favorite, but this one is amazing. Something of that nature. It's so every time I love it. I was yep. like, yes. And who would have imagined we'd be saying that when we read the Bible, huh? Right. Be like, you're like, I love this book more than the last one. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. I'm so love glad that. we're doing this, you guys. I'm so happy that this happened to us. Me too. So awesome. So awesome. Lord of the word. Jennifer Connolly, this was a humdinger. <laughs> yep. A little bit. Yep. Uh, yeah. Jamie Patton, thank you for that prayer. I am in agreement with you and Yeshua's name. May it be so. Amen. What are we praying? I missed it. Uh, we're praying for your health, buddy. Okay. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Love, hearts, hellos. Great to see you guys. Shall we jump right in here? Nathan's doing the dive. I think that means go ahead. Okay, I got the hook. I got the go ahead. And here we go. Yeah, can you imagine? Jamie says, can you imagine being Ezekiel? Yeah. Yeah. Your emoji face is the is the perfect emoji face for that sentence. It's just. Yeah. yeah. It's like, whoa. Which I'm sure we'll cover. I mean, your heart breaks for Jeremiah. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, boy, I tell you what. And then you start reading Ezekiel and you're just like, uh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just when you thought there couldn't be anything crazier, but wait, there's more coming to you from God. Yeah. Okay. Crazy. Uh, mm, Ricardo, lifetime comments. Sorry, have a lot on Ezekiel to share, but was not able to. Gonna post for next Wednesday. Well, Ricardo, it's never too late. We would love to hear your thoughts, and I'm next sure Wednesday's a lot fine. of us will be blessed by them. So, yeah, please post them, and we will read them. All right. General, uh, Jolyn Rice writes, Interestingly, I started reading Ezekiel in my New Living Translation Bible on Saturday. The first sentence says, On July 31st, which was the day I was reading. Wow. I found this very interesting, but then a little disturbing as I read more of Ezekiel. <laughs> yeah. Esort says the fourth month. Not sure how important the dates are or that they, or that they match or don't match in different translations. Uh, I think the counting of the months in the Hebrew calendar is different. January is yes. not the first month in the Hebrew calendar. So um, it's quite possible that, and in fact, I believe New Year's happens in the seventh month. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So like to just confuse everything around, nothing yeah. is, nothing starts at one like you would expect. So yeah, uh, that might be the reason why you're seeing fourth month and you're like, wait, this doesn't match. Yep. But it does. But so it does. even though you read July 31st and then it says fourth month, don't think that there's a mistake there. That's yeah. just because us Gentile people have a different calendar. But 
the date is translated. So yeah, it's letting us know what month it is in our calendar. But yeah, it's the same day. So, and actually, you know, the thing I find interesting because you mentioned the month, uh, the New Year's, is that mm -hmm. the uh, Hebrew calendar has technically two New Years, which I love. It has the year in which the the day in which the year starts, and then it has the year in which the like the growing of the food starts. Right. So, the first month you mean versus the yeah the first the month exactly yeah. So I find that interesting too. So I'm just saying that because some of you might be like, "Wait, I'm confused." There's right. two. Yes, there is. So you're not you're not confused. It's it's normal to misunderstand that there's two. It's very very interesting how that happens. Yeah, two different parts of life: life with God, life with life, and then there's life with growing food and seasons and stuff like that. So interesting. Mm -hmm. And Ricardo is saying real time, just one thing, Ezekiel 1 to 3 is definitely a close encounter, way too similar to <laughs> Revelations 4 and 6. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Danielle, I, I don't know the answer, maybe you do. Danielle is saying, have you heard of the Sefer Bible? If so, what do you think of it? The Sefer. C-E-P-H-E-R. Does that ring a bell at all? Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to I can't find the who's who's making the comment. I can't see it. D Danielle uh, Alanis. Oh, oh, Sefer Bible. Uh, I can't I can't say I know off the top of my head, but Sefer sounds really familiar. I'm wondering what the word Sefer means. How do I know that word? Sefer. I have to look into it. Uh, Ricardo says, and the little scroll is definitely some kind of tech. You mean the little scroll in Rev? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, they um, swallowed it, and they eat it, and they do not tell anybody. Yes. Evelyn says, this book is hard for me. Thank goodness for you all. Yeah, this book is... I remember, actually, because uh, when you are, you know overwhelmingly curious about trying to figure out uh, the ending let's put it that way and you read this book out of context and you jump into Ezekiel I'm not saying you did that I'm saying I did that when I initially read Ezekiel or tried to read Ezekiel I did read it out of context not in order uh, this was a long time ago I can't remember when and it was one of the most confusing things I ever did to myself <laughs> I couldn't tell who, what, where, why is this, when. It was just, oh, it was like gobbledygook. I was totally lost. So, yeah, uh, yeah. people would, and people would want to do that because Ezekiel, you know, they may have heard that Ezekiel might have some prophecies for end times or something like that. Or there's some correlation between Ezekiel visions and revelations, which of course there is. But yeah, people would be tempted to go, okay, I'm just going to go read Ezekiel now. Oh boy, good luck with that. Yeah, reading Ezekiel, I think reading the Bible out of order, period. I think the only yeah. thing you can read like out of order is some of the books of the New Testament. And like, you know, yeah, I would say some of the books are like, yeah. you know, Romans. I mean, and you could John. probably grab Job and read that as a standalone if you read. Yeah, because it's a nice little self and like packaged yeah. story. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. That's true. Yeah. We have a live question. Julius Hawkins says, how long did it take you guys to read the Bible? First time I read the Bible, I, I just read it like a book. I didn't study it. I just read it like a book. And it took me a year and two months to read it. But I gave myself a rule. So it might be faster for you. I, I felt like maybe I was a slow reader because if there was, if I got into, when I was reading and I, I got to a point where like, you know, you get that like, you're thinking about something else, and, but your your eyeballs are still reading, you know? And like, so you didn't even know what you just read. And that happened to me a lot. <laughs> so whenever it happened, I go all the way back to the part that I remembered and read again. And if it happened again, I go all the way back and I read again until yeah. I consciously like obtained the passages. So it, it, I felt that it took me a long time. I think people could probably read the Bible faster than I did, but it took me a year and two months. First time. Second time took me way longer because then I studied it and I used yeah. the I used the, the concordances. So, like, 
I remember when I started years. reading on my, before we before we did this before we did the EBRT. I started reading, and I think within a few weeks I had reached Psalms, and then that thing you just mentioned about your thoughts trailing and your eyes reading, that yeah. happened to me every single time I tried <laughs> to get through Psalms, and I'd fall asleep, and it was just be I hit an absolute brick wall, and it wasn't until we were doing EBRT that uh, when I read Psalms during the EBRT is a completely different experience. It was awesome. Mm. And uh, there's something to be said about taking your time. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And there's, of and course, I... something to be said about studying and doing it as a fellowship that's beyond beyond that even. So, yeah. yeah. I remember when you when you came to me too and you were like, I can't get past Psalms. Yeah. And I'm just like, that's interesting. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. you know, Psalms is one of those things that everybody loves. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, real quick, Scott answers what the uh, Cypher Bible is. It's basically a new King James version with translation of the proper names rather than translated improper names, I guess. Yeah, well, that's cool. If that's what it is, I dig it. I, I'll have to take a look at that. Let's, uh, but I, I feel like I know that word, though. Yeah. Okay. Transliterated proper, proper names. Yeah. Rather than translated proper names. So transliterated, oh, right. transliterated would be like they would write Yehovah instead of Jehovah. Right. Or right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Got it. Nice. Yes. Cool. That's cool. Okay. That sounds like that a good Bible. Cool. It is. Uh, all right. So next general question. Did you already read that one? Oh, yeah, you did. No, uh, no I didn't. Oh, Ricardo. Yeah. That's just a general comment. Ricardo's letting us know he. Okay. Did Got it, Ricardo. To... No worries. Yeah, no worries, bud. Yeah, and I apologize, guys, for not posting the graphic sooner. Uh, unfortunately, due to my medicine intake for my rash that I had from the food that I ate, um, I was so loopy that I never got a chance to get to reading the Bible, and I didn't know if we were going to be able to make it. But I really wanted to. So if you see me itching myself right now, which you're probably seeing me do, uh, it's just because I didn't take any meds today so that we could make sure we do this and also the same with yesterday. So that's why it took so long to get it up. Yes. Uh, Karen, yes, reading slow and being focused and present has become very important to me. And have you guys, I know I've asked this question before, but maybe you're new. Having the EBRT, this entire Bible read through, and you know that when you read it, you're going to be talking about it. Does that not or has that not changed the way you read the Bible? Having a fellowship and knowing that you're going to be speaking about the passages you're reading, has it, uh, you know, has it not helped you or, or kind of given you uh, just, I got a, for me, it's like an amazing new perspective. And it's like a way that my brain absorbs the information better because I know I'm not just reading it for myself, but I'm reading it for the sake of fellowship and to talk about it. And so my brain seems to gather it and collect it and understand it better. And of course, as some of you have also testified many, many times before, but because we have some new people I see on the on the video today, um, praying before you read. I mean, me and Alex testify all the time that the, we've noticed the days that we forgot to read. We're like, what's wrong with us today? And then one of us will be like, we didn't pray. And then we pray. And then the weirdest thing, it's like your brain gets turned on. And, you know, and for us, that's a really important part. So Yeah, because usually it's totally running on off mode. Like yeah. just the lights are out. No one's home. Autopilot. Yeah. Like zombified. <laughs> Going right through you. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. So let's get started. The, oh, thematic. Sorry, we got thematic. My bad. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Jennifer Connolly, Cherubim in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic literature. A celestial winged being with human, animal, or bird-like characteristics who functions as a throne bearer for the deity. Are these creatures specific to throne bearing only? And Sabrina says, I think so, because like, like I understand it, Jehovah made different kinds of angels and creatures in heaven, with each of them having their own specific roles. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. So, question basically being... Do the cherubim do anything other than carry the throne and accompany God wherever he wishes them to accompany him? 
Yes. The answer to the question is yes. They do do other things. They also guard the doorway to the Garden of Eden so nobody can enter. And they serve, technically, the, the word cherubim translates to, oh, come on, Nate, you know this. Oh, help, helper. It's like the helper. It's, so it's like it's like it's like it translates to like the one who serves or the one who helps or something like that. So, yeah. Um, it, it, is that the concordance one? I think so. Uh, n no, it's like the general casual. But anyway, but you could Google it. Oh man, my brain is blinking. Still leftover medicine in my head. Let me let's see if I can get it out. Okay. <laughs> Watch out! You might, you might, Did you, you see, know, you yeah. See, brain matter might come out. Fallout? Yeah, it might come um, out. So, anyways, uh, but yeah, the cherubim do other things. They do basically they're they're the ones who directly serve the Lord. So that's also why they're the ones who fly the chariot or the seat. They protect the seat or they cover the seat of God. That's why also on the uh, in the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant, you see the two cherubims and their wings are touching. Um, the cherubims look different too, by the way. These cherubims that um, that Ezekiel describes don't look necessarily like like. Uh, there's technically only this description of cherubims that have survived through through time, biblically speaking. Uh, there's other forms of cherubim-like creatures in other cultures that have been documented over the ages and stuff like that. But biblically wise, this is the only um, description of what a cherubim looks like, other than the the ones of the Ark of the Covenant. So. Yeah, uh, but the ones in the Ark of the Covenant don't describe having these multiple heads and, and so forth, or multiple faces, I should say, not multiple heads. But yeah, so that is interesting as well, that they do have other roles other than just uh, standing by the throne. So good question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to find cherubim and scripture here in Ezekiel. If anybody has... A chapter and verse for us then that would be awesome because then I could easily... what is it I just want to see I want to see cherubim in the in the scripture itself so we can click on the concordance and take a quick look oh your your e-source you should be able to google it I, I was looking for it in east I was yeah I was searching for it in e -sword and it didn't come up oh huh. you're right that's weird I guess cherub will make it come up uh, Ezekiel 9.3 Yeah, cherub. Okay, cherub. Cherub. Of uncertain derivation, a cherub or imaginary figure. Plural cherubims. Cherub. Yeah, but there's a... Um... Hmm. Hmm. But there is a... Uh... It's like a casual like Jewish understanding of the word. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, interesting. Something to look up, guys. Yeah. Um it is. All right, Ezekiel 1. Um Yes. Is it you or me? Me what? Oh, oh I'll read. read. Go for it. 1 4. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came up of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the mist thereof, as the color of amber, out of the mist of the fire, right from the start of his vision, it's already so amazing what he saw. Yeah. Ezekiel was pretty blessed by what he saw. And then, you know, not going to say he wasn't blessed, period, but boy, what the Lord asked of him was rough so, yeah um do you remember where you found that painting that we looked at when we were reading i just i just googled it but it was like a digital depiction is that what you're asking yeah are people asking for it yeah i could see people are saying they were a little bit confused trying to picture it and so was i and this helped me a lot i'm not saying this is exactly what it looked like or anything like that i'm just saying it just kind of helped at sure. least have all the elements at least have all the elements described or most of the elements just here it is i found it okay, okay. uh let me s figure out how to 
I think this one that we found is pretty good, guys. The only thing that seems like it's inaccurate of it is, oh, here's a good one too. The only thing that seems inaccurate is their, is their positioning. The wings aren't touching in this particular picture. Yeah. But the rest of it, it looks like the person spent a lot of time using a computer graphic to make it, so, yeah. Let me see if I can show it off here in our video. Oh, yeah. You're so um, fancy. You could just I post am. the link, though, too, so that people who are watching... Oh, no, putting in the video is better. You're so smart. Yeah. Okay, while you're doing that, I'll read yeah, the next comment. perfect. How's that? So we're perfect productive. idea. Okay. Uh, Ricardo. Oh, Ezekiel 1-4 looks exactly as a big spaceship entering atmosphere, thrusting down to break and land, also exactly as in Revelation 10-1, when another thing comes down the same way. Yeah. I noticed that too. Kind of interesting, huh? Sabrina, 113. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like the burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Wow. Just wow. Are you Yahweh ready? Has create hold on, hold on, yes. Yahweh has created such special and unique creatures can't wait to see them for myself when i'm in heaven hallelujah it's heaven is such an amazing place with things in it we just can't even think of and sumner says we can only imagine okay mm -hmm. go ahead here we go ready here it comes booyah booyah okay you guys see that so that's pretty good the only thing is is that they should be more side by side and their wings should be touching it says so they spent a lot of time, but it also when we'll probably get to it, somebody might mention it, but you see where it says the bow in the time of Noah. So that means rainbow. Uh, let me see if I can give proper credit to whoever the maker, uh, is. maker is. Aiden Kimmel, maybe, or it was a post by him. I don't know if that's the artist. Um, Pretty good. I don't know if that's the artist, but it is, yeah, it's a post by a, somebody named Aiden Kimmel. Uh, they may or may not have been the artist of this, and I don't see an artist otherwise mentioned, so. So you get the credit. So there that's you go. You. Just want yeah. to make sure they get the credit if what credit is Good due. Name. All right, there you go, you guys. That's an interesting picture. You can find yep. it on Google uh, Images. At least today you can. Hopefully it's still there in the future. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why we showed it. Very yep. well done, good sir. Bravo. You're so. Oh, tech usage. Finally. Technologically advanced. I love it. Yes, okay. We're so, we're so advanced. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So Sabrina Gilas, uh verses 1 5 through 114, is describing how these creatures look like. I try to picture them in my mind. They look so strange and phenomenal at the same time. Those four faces they have, one of man, one of a lion, one of an ox, one of an eagle. It's interesting. It's get it's getting so interesting already, and we're just started. Uh I got me th it got me thinking about there are also four gospels like four faces. Each of the gospels represent Yeshua a bit differently. Matthew describes Yeshua as King Messiah, that's the lion. In Mark he's represented as a servant. That's what the ox represents. Luke talks about him as the son of man. Yeshua came to earth as man, flesh. That's the man face of the creature. Uh, and John, we're going to read that he represents Yeshua as the son of God, the eagle, which stands for, the heaven, for heavenly divinity. The four gospels together have a complete picture of who Yeshua is. He is described from four different perspectives, just as these creatures represent the four different sides of Yeshua. Amazing. Wow, Sabrina, that's insightful. Um, very interesting. Ricardo says, I'm still digging into Ezekiel 1. I think that there is a translation issue. Words in Hebrew have a different order. Seems like it is describing the countenances and, and shapes of them individually. And seems like this cherubims are the same four in Revelation 4, also known as the riders of the apocalypse in Revelation 6. In Greek, it is written as four different like creatures. 
Okay, and Dina says, I tried to picture these creatures in my mind and ended up Googling what this whole scene might look like. Came across this YouTube clip which reinforced what I was imagining. And there's a clip here. Uh, nice. You guys can find it in the comments of the EBRT questions. You can find Dina's, Dina's YouTube clip. Uh, I, I am going to copy it here so I don't forget to check it out. Um, in fact, why don't I post it right now here in the chat? Mm -hmm. You guys can check it and, out later. And also, Ricardo, you know, uh, there are depictions too where it's one, it's, it's just as you said. So for those of you maybe you couldn't understand, so this is the four creatures in the picture that we showed. Uh, it's four creatures with four faces. And then there are people who make a depiction or are kind of talking about what Ricardo says is that the Hebrew is, if you, because Hebrew doesn't read like, it, it's not written and it doesn't read like English, if you will, or a lot of our more modern languages, um, there are people who depicted it as kind of four creatures in one, not just four creatures with four different faces each. So yeah, there are depictions of that as well. So you guys, you guys can see all this too when you Google it. Um, but either way, the symbolism is, is still still there, which would also maybe make sense as well, the fact that the two cherubim that are on the um, Ark of the Covenant, uh, you know, don't have an eagle on one side and an ox on the other and a lion on the other, you know, that kind of thing. So, yes. Uh, Julius, is it a sin to call him Jesus instead of Yeshua? Not a sin. Nope. It's not a sin at all. There you go. Okay. Jennifer Conley, is this one me? Do I get to read? Yes. Yay. Okay. Ezekiel 118, as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went thither was their spirit to go and the wheels were lifted up against them for the spirit of the creatures of the living creatures was in the wheels when those went these went and when those stood these stood and when those were lifted up from the earth the wheels were lifted up against them for the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels then she tells us the wheels equals ophan meaning revolve does this mean cycles is this part of the vision pertaining to the uh, silical nature of Jehovah? Oh, okay, I get what you're saying. Uh, silical nature of Jehovah and his teachings. Uh, example, repeat, reaping and sowing, uh, practicing feast, not linear, the way I want to think about it, but uh, like circular. Yeah, uh, I think that that would probably be part of it. The eyes and the wheels, the omnipresence of Jehovah. Yep, I would say that is definitely, a, uh, I would take that as a, a definite working symbol. The Esword commentary states the wheels were evidently symbolic of the cycle of divine providence, which cooperate with the ministers of the divine will. Hmm. Wheels within wheels uh -huh, is a spiral array, a pattern so grand and complex Rush natural science. Yes. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Wheels within wheels is, is I think, a Fibonacci sequence. It's the spiral. Spiral, yeah. Yeah. It could, well, and that's the thing is it's depicted as a wheel in the picture, as a wheel, and then one sideways right. is a wheel. Yeah. Maybe a wheel, a baby wheel inside a wheel, which kind of also looks like a jet. You ever notice that if you look at a jet, there's like a wheel inside the wheel? Maybe, you know and, all, and then there's and then there's there's little green men. But I mean, uh, you understand what I'm saying? I'm just kidding. Okay, so <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But yeah, yeah, that is it is interesting to think too about all the mathematical science and symbolisms here and stuff like that. Yeah, it's very interesting. But uh, it's interesting. You also mentioned the Fibonacci, and also uh, you know those basically like you know stoners had them on their walls in the 70s but like those spirals 
that are like spirals, spiral, spirals, and they kind of yeah. look like eyes. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what that's yeah. called. Though. Like spirals down to like micro spirals inside of micro spirals. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I do. So who knows? Um, Could you imagine trying to explain this to people though before you saw like all the things that we have in the technological world where we have like art and graphic design and computer generated imagery. Like if you weren't, you've never seen anything like this before. I was like, you got to give these guys of the Bible time some real credit trying to describe this stuff. I know for us, we're probably like, I don't get it. But you know, for them, they're like, me neither. Now yeah. you try to explain it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, when you don't have a vocabulary for something or you're not used to talking about a particular thing you just saw, you may have a very difficult time describing it. Just have a kid tell you about his day. Yeah. And yeah. They're, they're, they're having a tough time explaining this experience that they may have had. And you're, you know, a very mundane experience. Um, Julia, Julius Hawkins also asked, seraphims are a higher rank than cherubims, right? And that is correct. Yes. Seraphims are, are, are higher rank. I think seraphims are the highest rank of angelic beings, if you want to call it that. I believe. I think so, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Ricardo says, the thing is that, uh, real time, the thing is that we're reading in English translated words from ancient Hebrew that Ezekiel wrote 3,000 years ago, and we're using the, those words in the literal meaning when it might not be like this. Uh, am I explaining? For example, how will Ezekiel describe if someone goes back in time and gives him an iPhone when he doesn't know what it is? Yeah, it'll be a, a, a brick, a, a, a slim brick of light. Me a metal slim brick of light. Oh, he won't know. Has... He won't know it's metal. It's, it's like a they weird polymer. No, but it oh. doesn't. It doesn't. It's not really metal. I mean, it's depending on it's, what. It's, depending on what. It's phone crystal you have. glass or something. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we're with you, Ezekiel. We we know exactly what yeah. you're saying. We're with you, Ezekiel. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, are you trying to look at your phone and figure out how to describe it? I, I was. I was trying to get creative with my phone, and then I saw a text message from somebody. It's like, don't pick up your phone. You're going to get distracted. Okay. I know. Distracted. Squirrel. You got squirrel. squirrel. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. okay. Where are we? Sabrina 116 through 19? Um, yeah. Uh, Sabrina Gilas 116 through 19, is talking about the wheels that were with these creatures filled with eyes, and one of them is on the earth. So... Like, I understand this. These creatures monitorize everything? Monitorize? Do you mean motorize? Uh, everything that is going on on the earth? Because verse 19 says, And when the living creatures and when, when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Holy Spirit is the one who tells them where to go, and they follow his instructions right away. And Sharon Louise Roberts says, I was trying to get my head around the descriptions of the wheels. Also, the creatures filled with eyes gives me goosebumps. Um, it's a bit like a spider having lots of eyes. And Sabrina Gaila says, ha ha, yes, but uh, in this, it would be the biggest spider ever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, look, spider. there's no doubt that spending hours, days, whatever, trying to dive into this, praying, asking for guidance to try and understand this vision and all of it that it represents, um, there's no doubt that that's not a waste of time. So, um, That's not a waste of time. That, that it's not enjoy. a waste of time. Yeah. No, right, it's right, not right. a waste of time. So yeah. uh, I'm with you guys what is it all what are what are these these details aren't there just because these details are there for a reason yes so. they are there for a reason otherwise it wouldn't have survived to us today yeah yeah <clears throat> julius hawkins will we have an opportunity to ask more questions towards the end i don't want to keep spamming you during the read through uh if the questions are about these chapters yes you can ask questions otherwise julius we will actually have uh, a q and a now, we try to have like a Q&A once, I don't know, maybe once every two weeks uh, as of right now, uh, if not more, where you can kind of ask anything you want. Uh, so we'll be doing another video for that. But if it's about these chapters, yeah, feel free to 
to bring it up when we get to the chapter. So for instance, right now we're reading chapter one. Uh, if we get to like chapter three and you have questions about chapter three, feel free to ask them. That's, that's, this is a, this is a fellowship. It's not like two guys on a video, just telling people what to believe or what to know about the Bible. It's as you can see, actually what we're doing right now is reading other people's comments. So yeah, this is, this is what this is about. It's about people come together using modern technologies and uh, fellowshipping around the world, no matter where you're from. It's pretty amazing, huh? When you do it this way, it's pretty amazing. We think so. Jennifer Conley, Ezekiel 126 through 28. Uh, and above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in experience like a sapphire stone on the appearance. likeness of the throne. What? Appearance. You what said, I say? You said experience. Yeah, well, you know, it could be that too. No, in appearance. Thank you. Like a sapphire stone on the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also, from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, it, as it were, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a color, in a cloud, on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of, oh, am I reading it twice? No. It, it... it keeps going. Okay. Uh, sapphire stone. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper, jasper and ruby. And a rainbow stone like an emerald encircled the throne. So the rainbow mentioned here is the glory around the Lord. But this can also mean his promises, question mark. I'm going to say yes, because that's that is uh, what the rainbow symbolizes is, is his covenant with the earth. And, and uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. This is very special to me due to the amount of rainbows the Lord puts before me to get my attention and nudge me as if to say, I'm with you. Oh, that's awesome. Just uh, not just in rainbows, but in the reflection of my tears and my eyelashes, the dew on the grass blades, the flash on the street sign, the reflection of a spider's web, and most recently the reflection off my bike reflector onto the ground. Pretty cool. That's awesome, Pretty Jennifer. Cool. Hallelujah. That's awesome. always nice when the Lord gives us some kind of thing like that, that where he just kind of lets us know he's there with us. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um Julius, Julius you, go you, ahead. Want, you want to go, go ahead, buddy. You go, do it. So Julius, you ask a great question. So you're not spamming. Why did Yahweh make it so that there is so much symbolism in it? Would it be better if the meanings of these symbols were obvious? We think as humans, it would definitely be better if he would just tell us what he means by it all. It would be fantastic. But um, Yeshua does have a line that I'm going to pull here that he says, uh, he kind of, he speaks in parables. And I feel like this is a visual parable, if you will. And he says that he does that because he doesn't want everybody to understand the meaning. Uh, but those who will seek will find. Uh, those who dig deeper will know. And those who who are meant to have the understanding will get that understanding. So while it is nice for us to read this, it's not a salvation issue for us to understand what all these symbols mean, right? It doesn't It's not a salvation issue for us to understand why the eagle, why the ox, why the lion, why a man's head, you know, why, why are the wings touching? Why is there a rainbow around them? Like this, these aren't a salvation issue. So I have a feeling that, you know, based upon the way that Yeshua answered the apostles when they asked him why he spoke in parables, and this seems as a visual parable, this is my two cents, by the way, um, that it's for those people who this information will pertain to them. And and it might be end time people, as some people have mentioned in the, in the comments today, that these symbols also match with a lot of end time symbolism, uh, Revelation, Book of Revelation, Daniel symbolism, and things like that. So, um, yeah. I, I'm going to go with that. It's not for everybody to know and that it's meant to be kind of mysterious and maybe even just gives us something to do and seek after the Lord and, and to be excited about. And I don't know. So it's not just so plain and 
you know, on the surface, I guess you could say. That's my two cents. Mr. Lasky, you got something to add? Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's right. I think it's um, the multiple layers of knowledge and and mystery yeah. that God lays out before us. You know, things that uh, things that are salvation issues or things that are really like the Ten Commandments, for example, things that are very basic and meant a baby could understand is the idea. Uh, you know, a, a young a young child could understand. Everybody should be able to understand those kinds of things. But when it comes to the mystery of creation and the mystery of God, it's endless. And I think right. it's part of the part of the uh, joy of getting to know him is to ponder and occasionally maybe get a glimpse and maybe sometimes connect the dots of uh, of, of of the symbolism. And, and the Bible, yeah, the Bible is full of it. It's full of so much of this. And sometimes it jumps right out at you. And it's a huge, amazing, wonderful revelation and it, it gives you a richer experience and you realize that you know god's obviously going to be incredibly complex i mean we can't fathom the totality of god so you know he can come he can if he chooses to be mysterious it is entirely uh um it is entirely warranted let's put it that way <laughs> i think and on that, I agree with you 100%. And I just want to add one more thing. I think that on that topic too is, you know, I think that the the people had a certain level of understanding of technology and the way of the world when this was written, as as mentioned. It's like, what, 3,000 years ago? Something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. So what's really cool about these kind of symbols and about the fact that you you know the bible talks about how god will refine us like silver and he'll test us like gold the fact that these beings had legs of an ox that reflected like you know brass and what is brass you know what i mean it, it's copper with a certain part of i think it's uh, uh iron in it five, like five percent iron or something like that in it and so the cool thing is is that it's almost as if he gave a code, you know, for people in the future who are scientific, for people who, who have the ability to use a computer or a cell phone at their fingertips and look up what are the elemental designs or what are the applications of brass? Like what's significant about brass? Like, and what is the significance about an ox? And the more you would learn about ox and their role in the world or their role in humanity or their role back then or the symbolism that they've been used throughout history or the fact that, you know, the original ox uh, or the original way to write alpha the first letter of the hebrew alphabet would have been an ox head you know what i mean like things like this and just it, as you decide as you decide as the reader the person who's hearing this as you decide to look more into what is an eagle you know as an animal in reality what is a what is brass what is sapphire like what's the symbolism of these things like what's what is the molecular breakdown of sapphire you get into these things where you're just like so excited and it's so cool and you, you will actually learn that they have characteristics that do tell you and share about God. Let me add yes. on top of what you just said, and I think it's perfect what you just said, and let me add a little bit on top. These things function as proofs. Yes. They function as proofs. It's almost like an endless mathematical formula. The deeper you go, the more consistent it is. So when one day it is revealed to you, uh, in whatever fashion what this vision that Ezekiel had means just like Nathan is saying you will find correlations and points and consistencies to it throughout the whole story throughout the whole Bible and suddenly it'll it'll come it'll it'll just explode in your mind like a mathematical proof so that might be another reason just to show his absolute incredible majesty over the over the storytelling of yeah. this of this universe that nothing and is so, an accident and nothing is not thought of. And there is no element that has escaped his, uh, you know, his his mind, his control. I mean, it's it's endless. Uh, it's endless complexity that all has order in it and not chaos, which is what which is what the modern world would like you to believe. The modern yeah. world would like you to believe that this whole incredible universe was born out of a, a, uh, an unknown, weird explosion and everything is a matter of evolution and chaos and things just bumping yep. into each other and then finding the right kind of bumping get out of here with yep. that 
And the thing is, and, and on that too, like what's amazing is, is that I think every generation since Ezekiel wrote this, who's ever read these words have been in awe of it. And what's so cool is that for those of us who are in the future, 3000 years in the future with computers and technology and, you know, molecular structure breakdowns and yada, yada, you know, there's little things I'm just going to nerd out for one moment, just one little tidbit here. Right. One of the things that I love is it talks about how there's a fire and it talks about how like there's this, this, this fire underneath and there's a fire transferring and then there's lightning in the fire. And what I find very fascinating is that, you know, when a, and a volcano erupts, that lightning comes in the in the in above the above the uh, volcano, right? And I also love the fact that God presented Himself to His people as a pillar of fire and as a cloud. And what plumes out of a volcano is this cloud, right? So what's amazing is is that you do have these things like sapphire. You have a stone. You have the man who is looks like he's on fire, right? And then you have these guys' legs are made with brass, copper right? Electrical conduit. And then you have these wheels, something is spinning and it has eyes on it. So the thing is, is that, you know, I say all this basically kind of almost nudging you guys, which I normally don't do. But if you were to geek out on these things, if you were to go in and spend the time to study this stuff, you'd be like, okay, well, did this guy, is there anything that we know about Ezekiel that would tell us that he's basically like a rocket scientist 3,000 years ago and has the knowledge of these things 3,000 years ago? And how amazing is it that when you study it and you look into it, there's a lot of these things that we're finding out about in the not so distant past, you know, in the, in the relative modern era that we found out, okay, electricity, you know, uh, how does it work? Fire, movement, you know, uh, friction, when things spin, magnetics, right? And how that creates electricity. So, and the fact that the power is with them and they move with it as one unit, they're not separated. You know, there's so many little things that if you, if you really decided to geek out on it, you may ask yourself, okay, is this Ezekiel guy, just like a super whiz scientific guy who made this up and he was going to throw these things in there. Uh, and he knew all this stuff 3,000 years in advance? Or is this, as my brother Alex has just said, is this a way for God to say to later generations, this isn't just a guy having basically an LSD trip. Like this guy saw something real, and the fact that science later will make this make sense will speak to that generation and confirm the Bible. So this is another confirmation for us, and and that's what's really cool. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I want you guys to dive into it yourself. This is the kind of nerdy stuff that I like to do. And of course, we could, as I think many people from the emails I've got from you guys, is like, are we going to get past chapter one when we do Ezekiel? And uh, the answer is yes. We're going to do our best, and we're going to keep going. Uh, but it is infinite, and and we want to encourage you guys with with things like this. It's not that you're following the rabbit hole into this is a salvation thing, but if if you find yourself with time on your hands and you want to look into just the majesty of God and, and, and how fascinating this is and what would this mean to us today? And that's the thing is I think that I think something like this is, is a message for those in end times. And I think the more that we study as we continue to read, like our brother Ricardo said, the, the symbols pop up again. And they pop up again in the same kind of use, if you will. There's a bringing in the Lord and transferring out the Lord and things like that. And I just think that, you know, there's one, it's one thing to chase a rabbit and, and just kind of get enamored with it. And But if, you, if you're doing it just as a form of entertainment, there's worse forms of entertainment in the world than to kind of meditate on this. Is that the right word? That's a good word, right? Yeah. Meditate on this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, Nerd out, geek out? Yeah, I think, I think it's awesome. And... Um... You know, I I'd love to spend the time myself nerding out on it. I just yeah. wanna I just wanna keep rolling. I don't wanna I don't wanna stop the momentum. Um, I know. I feel uh, you. Uh, Julius, you're asking, how will I know if I'm saved for sure, or should I save that question for the Q and A? Uh, what's the question? Julius, how would I know if I'm saved for sure? Uh, or should I well, save that never... question for Q and A? I'll, I'll I'll answer very briefly a quick answer just for anybody who's watching this, but also for yourself, because uh, that's an important question, salvation question. I don't know if we ever know for sure that we're saved. 
I, I don't I, I I always stand in a, a very strange place as somebody who's in ministry I, I think ministers always want to tell you uh, of any type whether it's pastor priest or whatever they always want to tell you oh don't worry you're saved you know um, but I think that there can be ego that gets boasted or, or gets birthed out of a confidence that you're saved and it can lead us into the temptation of sin uh, I personally I trust that my salvation relies 100% in the hands of Yeshua who died on the cross, and I wouldn't want my salvation in anybody else's hands, not even my own. So I just trust in the promises of the cross. I trust in the fact that I believe in the cross, that I receive the cross, that I testify of the cross, that I testify of my salvation, and I trust that the Holy Spirit is in me and guiding me and growing me more every day in him. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will lead me to the end that the Lord has placed in my life. And so um, that's what I trust in. Uh, well, could I ever look somebody square in the eyes and, and, and say, I know for a fact I'm going to be saved? I mean, that would be I'd have to be able to stand before Christ and say the sentence I deserve to be here in, in heaven. And since I personally, I don't know if I'll ever feel as though I deserve the cross or I deserve to stand in heaven. I, I always just, I always just uh, surrender my faith to the one who loved me so much. He would die uh, as a sin, as a sinless being for me uh, to have salvation. So I, I would never stand before Christ and say, I I've done good enough. I checked all the things on the list and I deserve to be here. I could never say that sentence. So being confident in your salvation to me is a tricky thing, uh, but I, won't, I, I personally don't want to encourage anybody to be so confident in their, their salvation that they would look Christ square in the eyes on Judgment Day and say, I deserve to get in, but rather just say, I trust you, the one who loves me as much as you have demonstrated, to be the one who judges my right to get in or my right to be with you in eternity or not. So I, I hope I hope that I'm not discouraging you, but rather encouraging you, because trust me, there's no greater being than you would want your your fate to be in the hands of. Amen. 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 Took the words right out of my mouth, holding up the mic for you. I'm 100 percent in agreement um, with my brother here, uh, uh, Julius, and uh, we live in the hope. We live in the hope that when the time comes, we are saved. Um, yeah. And uh, but the work for our salvation has already been done. It is now up to us to receive it and mm. uh, to live in the hope and in the joy and in the appreciation of it. And uh, yeah, it's certainly not, as my brother has said, it's certainly not a thing where I would ever feel myself uh, even remotely deserving to stand and boast or demand that I be entry. saved. <laughs> yeah, demand entry. Like, hey, you see my passport here? On this date, I was baptized. On this date, I did this. On that date, isn't that enough, yo? Like, yeah. uh, may Lord, may the Lord never put me in that position. Um, okay. Woo. Where were we? Gosh, we're still in we Ezekiel are. one. I know we knew this would happen though. Everybody knew yeah. it happened, so we're doing good though. We we we, we keep going. We're, we're actually for us, it's kind of normal scheduling. We're, we're okay. Yeah. All right. Sabrina Gilas, uh, one twenty uh, uh, chapter one twenty six to twenty eight. These verses just need to be spoken out loud. It says, "And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne." was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it, above upon it. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw it, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake, Man, oh man, just picture this. I felt goosebumps all over me when I was reading these verses. The glory, beauty, might, and power that radiates from him. I would have fallen upon my face too. Yep, mm -hmm. Sabrina. Yep, that's a face plant right there. Woo! Boom. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh man, and it's funny because the the also the Holy Spirit that would have been flowing, you know, from the experience as well. Just like, yeah. can you imagine if if the Lord's allowing you to see this? And and by the way, Ezekiel, I don't know if anybody brings up that passage, but Ezekiel talks about how the Spirit hit him. Yeah, and the Spirit so, lifted him up. He was yeah. down on his face, and it took the Spirit lifting him. By and his hair. Notice, by his hair. Notice that Ezekiel yeah. mentions that he says the Spirit and the Spirit lifted me up. Or yeah. whatever I'm, I may have gotten the lift of me up part. I'm paraphrasing. No, he, he talks but, about and how it lifts. Well, how it, yeah. it lifts him. Yeah, it and lifts he, him up. And he talks about how it's like by his hair, which I took it as. I don't know if it like it pulled his hair. That sounds rather unpleasant. But I almost took it as like no gravity. Right. His hair like floated up. Maybe you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I don't know. That's that. That's just you know. Yes, by a lock of his hair, Jennifer Connelly yeah. confirms. Yeah. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. So, I mean, you're seeing this and then you're like, and then you experience it where you're like, you're being lifted up physically by the Holy Spirit, by the lock of your hair. You're just like, what kind of experience is this? It'd just be like brain melt wonderfulness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Which also, if you think about hair going up, static electricity, static, just saying, throwing that, throwing that out there as well. The details of this description are unreal. Like the accuracy, the, the way it all works together is just so cool. I love it. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. Ezekiel 3. Uh, I think that's you, my brother. Is it? Oh, yep. okay. Here we go. Evelyn Perkins, 3, 1 through 3. Can you explain this eating of the rolls? Esword said that the rolls was volume. So I know it wasn't a bread roll. This book is really hard to understand for me. I read it three times. Sorry, I don't understand. No need to apologize. It can be confusing, especially because of the translation issue. Dina says, I took it as a scroll. Yep, that's what it means. It means a scroll, uh, meaning God's word. Ezekiel was to eat it, the word of God, like thoroughly digest it before passing it on to the others. Your comment about the bread roll was funny. I was thinking more along the lines of a coffee scroll. <laughs> like, uh, I like it. Yeah. So it, a, a roll would mean uh, like the they the it was written on the front and the back. It says so. Yeah. It was. It would be a um, a scroll as we would call them in today's time. Yes, Chris Scott. Joe gets technical too. Yeah, he does. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yep. Mm -hmm. Bible is amazing. I mean, it's so amazing. And as 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 Alex said, you know, try trying to read Ezekiel completely out of context, like reading all the chapters that lead up to this, which is funny, right? Because if you just had a conversation with somebody, you're like, well, how does reading, you know, what happened with David and what happened with Job and what happened with Samuel, like, how do any of those stories have anything to do with what Ezekiel is talking about here? But yet it does, because along the way, God is told us the stories of creation and animals and the meaning of the tribes and how the um you know the high priest wore metals and certain stones which are mentioned here and how he goes into the holy of holies and there are cherubims on this weaponized box made of gold and wood and only certain people can hold it and they have to be wearing certain things so it's funny because you kind of have actually been you know miyagi if you will, through the Word of God, by the time that you got here. You were totally wax-oning and wax-offing the whole time, not realizing that you're building a, me a mental muscle that when you got to Ezekiel, you were like, oh, you know what? I actually get this, but maybe I don't know why I get this. And I know some of you are saying I didn't get it, but, but you might have a little bit more of a got it than you would have had if you just came in cold turkey, right? Because of all these symbols and the use of these things prior to arriving to. So this is all be kind of becomes like a total use of what you've heard so far. And this is also why I think it's really important to read the whole Bible front to back, because then imagine when you do get to more of these symbols that are used at the end of the book, they're not going to be totally blindsiding you. They're not going to be totally out of context. When you get to the end, you're going to be like, I've heard all these things before. I understand how these things have been used before. And now I see them being used together and with a description about what they mean. And I just think that this is 
This is why I say that the Bible, though yes, put together at the Council of Nicaea, was also under God's sovereignty, obviously. And, and I perceive that the Bible's order, uh, though not in chronological order always, definitely has an order that kind of matures us and, and educates us. So when we get to the moments where we read these things, we're like, it's not, we're not so blindsided or so completely uh, detached from it. We actually kind of get it. And now that we're talking about it, I mean, there's details in, in, in uh, Ezekiel's vision that exist in other visions, parts. For example, God on top of the firmament. And on the throne is something that we see in uh, Exodus when the elders of Israel go up onto Mount Sinai and they see something like that. And then uh, uh, a chariot, a, w a chariot being pulled by winged creatures. Uh, yeah. That's something Elijah sees. Uh, Moses sees God as a burning bush. Well, here God's described or the likeness of the Lord is in a fire, a man in a fire, a man of, from whom fire is around and emanates out of. And what's really mm -hmm. cool is that, uh, you know, as we read it in order, every time there's a miraculous appearance of the Lord, it's almost like there's a little bit extra. There's a little yeah. bit more. There's a little bit more. And so with Ezekiel, this one's like, whoa, so much stuff where he takes the time to describe so much detail, like you really get that there's the glory of God is being revealed in a greater way to all of us, the readers as well. Uh, exactly. So, you know, and and if exactly like uh, like like Nathan just said, if if you grab it, read it out of context, you might assume this sort of thing is happening in every chapter. No, it's not. Right. <laughs> not right. even close. Not even yeah. close. It, it's very rare. And in, that's another thing that makes the book of Ezekiel so like bong because you know in 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 and other prophets they said uh, you know that the and the lord said thus and thus or and and uh i received you know and and the word of the lord came and said or the word of the lord came and, and did whereas here it's like ezekiel is getting the uh you know a lot more than just a voice perhaps he's getting this huge vision yeah it's it and it's I guess one of the things like I, I perceive is like the Bible is kind of like you actually if you if you remember you probably don't but if you if you remember that when we very 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 first video where we were talking about doing this entire Bible read through you probably remember me saying that reading the Bible is like watching all the pixels come into focus and with every word you read it's like adding another pixel to the image of God. And as you read the entire Bible, you actually get to see the, you know, the whole image of God, if you will, as much as the Bible, you know, gives us. Uh, but another maybe more simple way to say, I mean, that's obviously a modern way can understand that. But another more simple way is it's kind of like watching a flower grow. You see the first petal, then a second petal, then a third petal, and then it slowly opens up. And then all the petals are shown at the same time. And then it all makes sense what's going on, right? And that's like, to me, what the Bible is. It's a reveal and it's a step-by-step -step process. And it's amazing because you think you're just reading this historical book. You think you're just reading this like story, but within every single part of it, you know, as we testify in this entire Bible read through. So if you've been doing this with us in real time, you understand what I'm about to say, but how much of the Bible is like, it's almost as if we're speaking. It's almost like we're, it's so many people have said as we're doing this entire Bible read through, they're like, wow, the Bible is so applicable to today. Wow, the Bible actually does apply to my life right now. Oh, wow, I can relate to all these people in the Bible. And that's something that, you know, people who cherry pick or only told the Bible or learn the Bible in a, in a unlinear way of reading it. A lot of the times they're just like, I just don't see. It doesn't talk to me. It doesn't speak to me. It doesn't apply to me. I, it, it's so out of date. And it's just like, I don't know what Bible you're reading because it's not the one I'm reading. It's super in date to me. And and that's the difference. It's like, so, yeah, I think you guys get what I'm saying. Yeah. Mr. Lovonsky? Yeah. Um, Jennifer yes. Connolly. Is it Jennifer Connolly? Ezekiel 3. Yes, 3.3. Three, yes. three. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. 
Ezekiel 3, 4. And he said unto me, Son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with thy words unto them, for thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech, and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel. In my Bible, it cross-referenced this to Revelations 10, 9. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Uh, and I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as, I, and as soon as I had eaten it, in my belly, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. One was sweet, and the other was bitter. Was one message e easier to swallow than the other? The latter was the cross. Is that why it is bitter? Interesting. This is, this is a good question, and I don't know if we should answer it yet, because I feel like when we get to Revelation and we actually get to the part where it talks about being bitter in the belly, I think that it's a huge reveal. Uh, I think it's a really important reveal. Uh, so... I'm gonna. I'm personally gonna bite my tongue on this one, even though I want to talk about it so much. But it's a. It's another one of those really long conversations. But don't worry. When we get to Revelations 10, we're totally gonna recall this part. So it's not like we're gonna not tie this together when we get there. So. And Jennifer, in case for some odd reason, when we get to Revelations 10, we do not tie it together. You will be there to remind us. I'm sure. I hope so. Yes. I seriously doubt we'll not be able to tie it together. <laughs> yeah, <we'll, we're> gonna, <laughs> I know. It's just, it's just, we're going to look up everything that I has just, to do with I am exci I'm so. excited to hear what you would have to say, Nathan, about that, and I'm excited to, to, for us to all explore I, that. I will, I will say this. This question that you ask about the eating, and it was sweet like honey and then bitter in the stomach, it was a question I asked myself for like like maybe seven years before I, before I felt like the Lord like showed me what it meant. You know, so, uh, but I believe that it's an end time message. So I believe that, you know, it, it's important that we go through the rest of the Bible and then we talk about it when we get to Revelation and it talks about that particular message. So, but I, 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 I this was one of the things that drove me nuts for a while because I was like, this seems like it's really important to me and I'm not getting it. Like, I don't understand it. And then I felt like one day the Lord, <laughs> at least for me, gave me an answer that, that my heart, you know, was just like, okay. That makes sense. Thanks, Lord. So Je Jennifer is making a funny, a funny joke here. Oh, come on! What if he comes back before then? <laughs> well, hopefully, uh, we, our pacing Alex will be better. Is taking way too long, but that's yeah. what my answer yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, our pacing will be better than like taking us seven years to get to Revelations ten, right? Oh, you just um, told him how long it is before he comes back. What did I tell you? I said, don't tell him the timeline. Oh man! Just tell him, okay. <laughs> Everybody's like, wait, what? Just kidding, guys. We're kidding. Are we? Okay. Uh, we have plenty of time to finish this. Okay. <laughs> Sabrina Gailas. Three, eight through nine. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces and thy forehead strong against their foreheads as an adamant harder. Adamant? Yeah. Harder than flint have I made thy forehead. Fear them not. Neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Yahweh made Ezekiel strong and filled him with his strength, so Ezekiel could endure everything the Lord asked him to do, because he was going to face opposition. Yeah, he was. Yahweh still does that today in us. I can feel his boldness and fire inside of me. I don't care what anyone thinks of me when I'm telling them about Yeshua, because I know from all the experience that I had so far that he is who he says he is and that is really doesn't matter if people believe me or laugh at me or laugh what i say or if they do take it in although some of them might not believe it or act like they don't from the outside still there are seeds planted a bam truth being spoken right there the words and our testimonies that we speak to and share with others will be inside of them and they will think about it later on scripture says that his word doesn't come back void isaiah 51 11 says so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth and it shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which i please and it shall prosper in the things whereto i send it so we are instruments to share and spread word, his word wherever we can 
wherever we go. And in the Gospel of John, he talks about how his fruit are promised to bear fruit. So when we receive and we believe and we do what he commands us to do, it is promised that we will bear fruit. Isn't that amazing? Come on. It's amazing. It is amazing. Evelyn Perkins says, what? Rewind. Don't what are know. we rewinding? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Ask Did again, I, man. I don't know. I was. I. I what? Who? Are you not paying attention what? again? I, Unbelievable. Your, what are we doing? I have no idea. I'm just. I'm just here to enjoy the show. I'm just enjoying. I watch and listen to you. You smart people. That's what I do. All right, Sabrina Gilas, three, fourteen, fifteen. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away, and then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Abib that dwelt by the river Kibar, and I sat where they sat, and remained there astonished among them for seven days. Like I understand it from reading these verses, Ezekiel wasn't on the earth with his body uh, either, because he says that the spirit took him away and was brought back to Tel Abib, where he first was by the river of Kibar. Or maybe he was physically still on the earth, but only his soul was taken up. Hard to say, probably even when you've had an experience like this, I suppose. Like Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 12, 13, 12, 3, Whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. And it took Ezekiel seven days to recover from this experience. Yes, I can imagine that. Yeah. Yeah, Ezekiel yeah. was definitely tripping. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. I will say, okay, I'm just going to chime in real quick with this part. Mm. Well, I have to now. Could go and mate. So, as you guys know, if you know my testimony about when I had my event almost exactly eight years ago uh, with my 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 death experience, as I like to call it, uh, you know the experience I had. It took me three months of like learning how to function in the world again. I mean, all I could think about every second day was how do I die and not make God mad. <laughs> That was it. How do I go back? How do I get back to that? Right. And I thought about like, I could go hang out in front of schools, wait for a child to look like he's maybe going to get hit by a bus, pretend to push him out of way, get hit by the bus and die. And I was a hero. Like I thought about like the most crazy amount of ways I even looked into seeing if I was too old or if I could sign up for the military. And then I would like intentionally, you know, take a grenade for somebody. Like there was so many things. I mean, and the amount of like effort I went into to plan my exit from this world to get back to that place. So I can totally relate to not obviously to what he experienced, but in the sense that there's like a recovery process to like re-enter into the normal mundane life again. It's just crazy. So I think I there's a lot of you a lot of you in the fellowship can relate to that. You've had you've had moments where the Holy Spirit has come and revealed himself and and uh, yeah you've had experiences i have and it took me three weeks and uh yeah you know it was incredible and yeah, I'm not, I'm not and crazy. so for and that now comparing what i experienced to what ezekiel experienced and oh boy uh yeah for ezekiel to take only seven days man ezekiel is pretty together that guy has got some controls of his faculties or something he's pretty he does he's pretty awesome that was a very very good way of explaining it and ezekiel is yeah this guy hat off to you good sir hat off to you yeah um so uh gee da la ba da ba do yes. jennifer connelly 314 are that's you reading you. my oh no that's, that's me you. yeah I just read. No. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, okay, so... No, I just read. I oh, can read fine. this one if oh, you want. Yeah. I'll read. It's no. fine. No. Okay. No. You go. No, you go. No, no, no you, you go. Me fine. What? You do it. You got the radio voice. They like to hear from you. Read the long no, one. No, now that you said that, no. No, you do it. Okay, fine. I'll do it radio voice then. Jennifer Connelly, Ezekiel 314. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went to bitterness in the heat of my spirit. And the hand of the Lord was upon me. Am I doing good? Yes. Then um, I came to them of the captivity so of Tel Aviv, 
and they listen. I'm reading yeah, the high, Bible. I, I have high quality uh, earphones on too. It's really wonderful. Oh, that's true. You do. I have my earpiece in, guys. So you know, it should be more better There's sound. No Kermit, thank God. I know. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna refrain from the Kermiting in the future. Okay, let's start over. Shall we focus? Yeah. Can you focus, please? Ezekiel three fourteen. No, I can't. I'm, I can't. I'm just overwhelmed by the spirit. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away and i went into bitterness in the heat of my spirit but the hand of the lord was strong upon me then i came to them of the captivity of tel aviv they dwelt by the river of chabar and i sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days a watchman for israel and it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the lord came on to me saying son of man I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word of my mouth, and give them warning for me, from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speaketh to warn the wicked from his wicked ways, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. The Lord took him basically in the spirit to the prison for seven days. But it again uses in bitterness. Uh, where was his body? When he came back into his body, he didn't hear from the Lord for the seven more days. Uh, it cross references Jeremiah 42 7. And it came to pass after 10 days that the word of the Lord came onto Jeremiah. Obviously, this calling wasn't optional. And God showed him that, but why the 10 days? Showed him that. But why the 10 days for Jeremiah and 7 for Ezekiel? Recoup time, digesting what just happened. Can you imagine waiting those days out? 10 means the completion of a cycle. Number 10 in Bible is a symbol of perfection, harmony, and creation. It is also a number of integration, discipline, laws, and wholeness. Number seven is the number of completeness. Very good stuff. Well done. You did really good work on that. Thank you, Jennifer Collin. Hmm. Mr. Lavosky looks perplexed. He's reading comments in real time, I have a feeling. No, no, I was actually rereading Jennifer's. I, I liked it, so I was reading it again. Well, was my reading not good enough? I, I was, I was so I was distracted reading? by your silky voice and, and, and the, the quality of it in my uh, fa fancy earphones that I, uh, you know, had to reread for comprehension. Okay? Okay? Goodness mm -hmm. gracious. Julius is asking, I already know to look in the original language, Strong Sikorius, but what translation are you guys reading right now? Well, everybody is posting, so we don't know what they posted. We're reading people's comments. So what we're reading, I think that was, is... No, that wasn't King James. That might have been probably NIV or ESV or something like that, NASB. Those are usually the most common that I think we hear from people is NIV, ESV, NASB. Those are usually the most common that I think most people are, are you reading from, or, or obviously, and then King James and New King James. So yeah. Sabrina Gilas, 318 to 21. Good, sir. You have a concussion, Jennifer? Oh, I, my heart breaks for you. I hated having my concussion. Definitely pray. Lifting you up right now in Yeshua's name. Oh, my concussion was horrible. That is a scary feeling. I do not like it, Nathan. I am. Lavosky, this is you. I know. I'm rereading Jennifer's comment. Um oh. Are you so, thinking about? I, I'm just thinking about this port. This this part. It, it, uh, I'm trying to remember what I thought when we read it, and I'm trying to. And right now, I'm seeing that it seems like uh, Ezekiel was taken in a vision, or perhaps in body as well, and he just was sat with the people in captivity. But either that hadn't yet happened because uh, Jerusalem hadn't yet been totally destroyed or there was already a group of Israelites or a group of people from Judah who were already in captivity in Babylon or or on their way to captivity or something like that right um, yeah so also Ezekiel 
Yeah. Ezekiel comes after Jeremiah as a person as well, like not just in the storyline. You know what I mean? So it could be that there was already some captivity going on since also it was done in waves. I mean, like the whole thing and, and releasing them back, yeah. the fighting and all that kind of stuff. So it could be that. Yeah, and Jennifer, I guess when you say the Lord took him basically in the spirit to the prison, you mean to the to the to the people who were captive, yeah. Okay. All right, sorry. I just I went on a I was mesmerized by that. Okay. Sabrina Gilas, uh three uh Ezekiel three, eighteen through twenty one. In speaking about Jehovah made Ezekiel a watch it is speaking about Jehovah making Ezekiel a watchman that he was responsible for others, and it was his task to tell them if they were doing the wrong things in the eyes of the Lord. If he would not tell them, their death and blood was upon him. Wow, what a responsibility. And certainly not an easy thing to do, because the people were so stiff-necked. But, at the other hand, Jehovah filled Ezekiel with his fire and strength, so I believe he was up to the task given to him. Because our God is such a great God, he will not say to us, do this and that, without equipping us first. We go into battle, but with our armor on. Yeah, and I think mm -hmm. uh, later in this chapter, if I remember correctly, it describes how uh, he basically shut Ezekiel's mouth on <coughs> any matters not important for Ezekiel to speak on. But when Ezekiel mm -hmm. did have the opportunity to speak now what God wants him to speak, as you've said in our reading, Nathan, that God expected him to say it and not to hold it back. As as he told him it. As he told him he, it, yeah. He was very clear. You tell them everything I say and don't dilute what I'm telling you. Like, don't soften it. Don't right. don't don't make this easier to swallow than what I'm delivering it as. Right. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, huh? Sabrina, 323 through 24, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise and go forth into the plain, and I and I will there walk with thee. Oh, what a promise. Come on, somebody. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there. My mind is melting. I saw similarities here with Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and so many others in the Bible. Yahweh told or asked them to do something. Step one in the situation, it's him telling Ezekiel, to go to the valley and there would he start talking to him. So step one for Ezekiel and so many others is to obey him in this step because if he didn't go to the valley, there wouldn't be step two. The Lord talked to him. So important for us to obey him in the little things first before he will trust us with the bigger things. We have to take it step by step. He doesn't give us everything all at once, but rather piece by piece. Exactly. And a lot of the times what he tells us to do doesn't make any sense like lying on your side for a year and a half just saying spoiler alert yep sabrina gylas 3 25 through 26 but thou o son of man behold they shall put bands upon thee they shall bind thee with them and thou shalt not go among them and i will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth that thou shalt be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover for they are a rebellious house Ezekiel had to endure some hard things in his life, but at the same time this was a sign from Jehovah because all the people who knew him and saw him could see that this man first could talk, and now suddenly he can't, and then after he after the appointed time again can speak. I was wondering why Jehovah did this to Ezekiel, that he wasn't allowed to go to speak to the people right away, but first would get tied up and wasn't able to speak for a for an amount of time, or was the being bound referring to what comes next in chapter 4, that he would be tied up to go lie on his right side and left side for an amount of days. What do you guys think? I think I think Nathan basically already mentioned it. Yeah, I think, I, I think that his tongue was actually bound because we also see that also in uh, John the Baptist's dad. So we, we see that again later as well. But I, I believe that his mouth was actually bound. I would say that I perceive it as... If you if if he's known at all by anybody, family, friends, and then he can't talk, and then all of a sudden he does talk, and then what he says is like, "Hey, God says this," you know, then people would believe him. And the more rare he his words were, 
you know, the more spare, sparse they would be, the more the, the weight his words would have. That that's what I perceive, anyways. But um, but I think also your your point about him laying on his side could also tie into the time period. But I think it has more because it says he he what his tongue was stuck to the roof of his mouth. So I think it's physical. I think like he actually made it so he couldn't talk, just like uh, John the Baptist's dad. So yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it kind of makes sense. He was setting Ezekiel apart. Is it, the words of Ezekiel would have to have weight. They, he couldn't, in a way, he was trying not to give, he, he was trying, excuse me, he was not allowing the people to have access to Ezekiel like they normally would. Treat him like mm -hmm. one of the guys. Because right. that's what happened with Jeremiah, to some extent, is he was available, he was accessible, he was constantly telling the truth, and then they just got used to it, and they were just like, eh, you know what? Eh, you know, you know, we said we'd listen to you. We said, but we don't want to. Mm -hmm. uh, and why? Well, because you what? Like Yeshua said, you're not a prophet in your own in your own town, or what was the exact quote? Country. In yeah. your own country. Well, yeah, but country, I think, is different. I don't think it means like how we mean yeah. it by nation. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like basically mm -hmm. your own house. So yeah. for the sake of uh, for the sake of Ezekiel's message actually carrying weight, it makes sense that Ezekiel was just used completely for one purpose. And then and then he tells him later, which I'm sure you guys will mention. He tells him later about you know you shall eat in this, you shall do all this in the sight of the people. They need right. to see you do this. I'm gonna see you do this. Yeah. Uh, Sabrina Gailas, uh, Ezekiel four. Um, oh, go ahead. That's your read. Didn't I just read? I don't know. Did you? Yeah, that was me reading, and I think I don't know. I'll, I'll just read. Okay. Sabrina, guys, more uh, uh, four, more unpleasant things that Ezekiel had to do. Being tied up, go lie down so many days on his left, and then so many days on his right side, and not getting much to eat or drink. He even had to bake his food, uh, that little that he was allowed to eat, in the stool of men. Yuck. But even in this situation, Jehovah shows his grace because Ezekiel had never ate something unclean before and wasn't happy about having to do that now. Jehovah showed grace by letting him use cow dung instead. I'm so happy to be living in these times we are in now, having electricity among so many other things that we have now, and having more pleasant ways to prepare our food. When I'm reading things like this and think about how people had to do certain things so many years ago, I'm even more thankful that Jehovah lets me live in this time of Earth's existence, and of course, also after Yeshua's death and rising. Yeah, we're definitely blessed uh, in that way. But uh, I don't, I don't think, I don't think cooking food and dung was a regular thing. I think it was specifically. I, I don't know if that's what you're implying, that everybody had to, <laughs> everybody had to kind of suffer through eating some form of dung. Uh, no, that was definitely something specific for the moment. And uh, it was almost like, you know, Ezekiel was uh, interceding, in a way. What? Interceding. So he yeah. yeah, he was. Yeah, he actually does. It says it was. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. That he was interceding for Israel. That if he does this, that when when he does this, as he's told to do, then the Lord may show grace upon the entire nation. Um, mm -hmm. Man, oh man. Man, oh man, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord for his grace and mercy and for those who the Lord those who the Lord calls to intercede for us. Amen. And who pray Amen. for us. Yeah. Oh man, this is brutal though. I couldn't imagine what this is like for Ezekiel. Couldn't imagine. Yeah. Uh Sharon Lewis Roberts, Ezekiel four, verses four through five. Then lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of the days that you lie on it, you shall bear their punishment. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. This sounds uncomfortable, and I'm thinking about bed sores. Well, not only that, but he didn't have a bed. <laughs> so it's like not like our modern mattresses. In verse 8, he had ropes on him to stop him turning. Then he slept. Uh, we naturally turn side to side. And what about rest breaks when nature calls? Yeah, exactly. Oh, 
poor guy. Sabrina says, haha, yes, I was thinking about the practical side of all this too. It had to be so uncomfortable. Indeed. I mean, Indeed. this was, this was, this was, uh, this, this, you know, this was also undoubtedly to prove to all the people that Ezekiel is doing this to himself. Uh, not because, uh, he, he wants attention. Or to he be wants, cool. yeah, attention or to be cool. Or this is this is beyond all reasonable. Uh, this is this is beyond all things that one might reasonably do to to get attention. <laughs> you know, and and, right. to, and to set him apart from all the false prophets who would never in a trillion years do any of this stuff. Right. They would come probably on a fluffy pillow and 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 with with gold bells and they would say the glory of the, you know the, the the favor of the lord has look at the things he has given me and they would try to prove that they are i'm i'm parap i am imagining this but they would try to prove that their material wealth blessings or status are a sign of their connection to god and yeah. here uh um you know ezekiel is very clearly saying no 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 i have i have seen god and this is what i now must do to intercede for you, uh, yeah. and for the whole nation, and uh, anybody who would witness this, anybody who would witness this, I'm fairly convinced would 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 have to at least think about it. <laughs> they, I think the thing that I find fascinating about Ezekiel in this part, and you know, many if you've been around for a long time and you've watched a lot of my Q and As, you've probably heard me mention one of the prophets which you know now you guys know is ezekiel but one of the prophets being told by god to lay on his side you know for like a year and then turn over and lay on his side for like another you know month or whatever and it's just like who would you tell this to who would believe you right like if you went to your mom your dad your brother your sister your teacher your boss and said oh i have to take a year off of work and i have to lay on my side because I'm going to, you know, save people from being abused by, or like, you know, being, you know, reprimanded by God. People will be like, obviously this is not of God. Like how often do you hear Christians respond with that? Like, oh, that's not of God. That's not of God. That's not of God. It's just like, uh, have you read the Bible? Have you read what God asked people to do? You know, like the stuff that God asked people to do is not the stuff that any Christian would think that God would ever ask anybody to do. You know, um, from this to marry a, a prostitute to like, I don't know, all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Like kill entire faith of people this, like this or is, races of people. It's crazy. The Bible proves itself that it is not a made up happy story of somebody looking for comfort in some kind of religious belief. It proves yeah. itself. The right. example, it's not, the, the, it's, it's, it's the, you want to read a book. You want to read a book that is critical of the nation of Israel? Read the Old Testament. Right. You know, that that to me as 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 a Jew it proves it 100% that this was not a work of man trying to make himself feel better. Quite the or look good. Or look good. Yeah. And and for for the hero to for for the hero/servant of this particular moment in the Bible, his glory is to lay on his side and eat dung um it's it's like it's just indicative and, and if i there's no doubt in my mind that he's a hero and there is no unglory about what he had to do what he had to do is much harder than you know jumping on a galloping horse with a sword in hand and a giant army and conquering some enemy yeah uh you know i think i think about too is like i i have a slight case of scoliosis right so like if you lay on your side all the time too you know how you're like you're, you're you'll i mean think about what that would do to your spine oh god uh, you, right? know. you know what i mean so yeah. it's just like i always think about that too like when he gets up one he'll have muscle fatigue and then he's got to roll over lay on the other side it's just like it's just crazy to me like again the, the details of this kind of stuff is just i don't know it's mind-blowing as you said you, you say it so well it's like it's one of the great points is like you you real if you read any other spiritual book Yeah, if you, I'm trying to think of any other book, right? All these other spiritual books, it's like the the book is always about the people who are the cool people. They're always like the yeah. really gifted, the really blessed. Everything works out right for them. You know, maybe there's one slap on the hand. Maybe they went like one period of time where they like self, 
feasts, fasted and, you know, got hungry or ate very little. But other than that, like, there's no, there's no like book about God where the people like don't get it and they're confessing it. They're like, yeah, so there was God. He interacted with us and we're like, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Oh, we're special. All right. Well, now we're going to pretend like you never told us anything and we're going to mess up for 300 something years. And and then you're going to smite us all down to a couple thousand, you know, because there was millions of us. And it's just like there's just no nobody tells a story like this. Right. Everybody always kind of twists and turns it and everything like that. And yeah, it's just there's it, this isn't as you say the glorifying hollywood story if you wanted to paint yourself in a really good light you wouldn't tell this story about yourself yeah. you know or your people yeah. <laughs> so. and, and and it is remarkable that after such a such a just a crumbling you know that they're receiving here in in at the hands of babylon it is remarkable that the culture survives venerates and holds on to the story and, and tells everyone, essentially, in, at least in the story, in the book itself, it's, it tells everybody that the reason this is, is because God ordained it so. And it's like, who would find me another nation, another God, another religion, where they essentially receive and rejoice in the suffering? Mm -hmm. I know that, but think about it. If you had to tell this story to somebody... Like you were like, my grandpa did this. Would you not think to yourself, I'm not telling anybody this story. It's right. Gonna make me look, like, it's going to make yeah. me look like my grandpa's crazy. They're not going to, yeah. why, they, why would anybody believe that my grandpa heard from God, laid on his side and ate bread with cow dung in it? Like, you know, and he saw like an acid trip. Like who am I going to tell this story to that would even care and not like immediately, deep, you know, unfriend me from Facebook? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, Especially in today's culture. I mean, you're yeah. describing... Yeah. No, they had Facebook back then. You didn't know that. Three thousand. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm just saying, like this, this. This should be double. This should be double, triple, mind blowing to us. And I think it yes. is. Yeah. All right, Sharon Lewis, go for it, brother. This one's yours. All right. Uh, uh, Sharon Lewis Roberts, Ezekiel four verses four to five. Then lie on your left side and place the punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of days that you lie in it, you shall bear their punishment. For I assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of years of their punishment. So long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. This sounds uncomfortable, and I'm thinking about bed sores. In verse 8, he had wrote... Did we just, didn't we just read this? No. He, no. Uh, uh, yes. But it's okay. You, you just keep... No, we read above. We read Sharon Lewis, which was 4-5. And now no. you're reading Jennifer Connelly. Oh. Oh, I know. I was reading Sharon Lewis. I, I, I totally was just reading Sharon Lewis. Okay. Jennifer oh. Connelly. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. No wonder. Okay. Then yes. Yes. Yeah, read Jennifer and, and when... Uh, okay. Iniquity. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day of, for a year. Ezekiel had to lay on his side... For 365 days, was this spiritual warfare or preparation for his calling? He was a priest, a prophet, which I believe, and prophet, which I believe was rare. Was this intercessory prayer? Yeah, I think it was all of those things. I think it was oh, all of above. those things. And and it was literally what God said. You are going to bear their punishment. Mm -hmm. And Ezekiel being a priest and a prophet, I guess that makes him a Levite. And if he was a prophet then he would probably be, since Samuel, I don't think there was. Although Samuel wasn't, a, was Samuel was a, a Levite? Priestess. There was a priestess. Yeah, Samuel was a Levite. And yeah, a he was. Yeah, so he was a priest and a prophet. Yeah, he was both. He was both. And I don't remember if there was another one after him until Ezekiel. Not a priest prophet, that's a good point. I'm trying to think if there was. I don't know. I don't think so. I think Ezekiel might have been the next one. So that that may actually clue us in to why Ezekiel's profiting is, and doing it the way he is. prophesying was so intense. Because well, he and was also actually a priest. Also, there's a thing here too. So why, since you mentioned that, remember too that there is another covenant made during this time period, and also there's no temple. So if the Lord creates a new covenant, which is a pre-covenant to Yeshua's covenant, 
And then there's one who absorbs the punishment on our behalf, right? If you look at that covenant, if you remember in Jeremiah what that covenant was, uh, then, you know, this also kind of makes sense as well, because now you no longer need the temple for intercession and for a one to to do on behalf for the sake of the of the whole right because god says i'm going to do something that has nothing to do with the mosaic law that has nothing to do with the covenant made before with moses so this could be the beginning of what we're seeing obviously i think everybody clearly sees the symbolism here with yeshua yes and so forth so yeah mm -hmm. um I mean, I think maybe during this time the temple was still up, but it doesn't matter. I mean, we're going into a time well, when the but temple won't be. Yeah. If, if he's laying on his side, though, was the temple still up? Um, I don't remember. We'd have to look it up. Because I think either before this or after this, he shows them. Might be after this, or maybe it just seems like it's after this. He shows them the elders of Israel in the temple Oh. doing their thing. He could have been showing them a past vision of though i think he was showing them a past vision of why he had to bring this on him it's possible. especially if ezekiel wasn't alive at the time right it's possible right yeah. I, I i'm i'm thinking that's what it was but we could be wrong so we, we will have to go to that and let's bring that up next week if, unless somebody brings it up between now and the end of this video but yeah very important very good mm -hmm. very important it's good sharon lewis Roberts, that's you Okay, Ezekiel 4, 12 through 15. This seems like an unpleasant conversation. I like the fact that there was a compromise on the dung situation. Cow dung is definitely less offensive, especially as they can dry up and be thrown like a Frisbee. <laughs> I looked up pictures on how cow dungs were used for fuel. They were built like pyramid shapes to start a fire. I did stop at that point before going into the rabbit holes over cow dung. Crystal Lewis pyramids don't know don't want to know Dina says I know right it was also I was also thinking about how popular Ezekiel bread is now and how expensive to buy well at least here in Australia my kids always tell me how healthy it is and I always remind them of the story behind it yeah of course we don't have to add the dung in in our Ezekiel bread but yeah it is interesting that there's a company what if there is dung in the Ezekiel bread there might be it might be why it's so healthy though if you think about it you know lots of nutrients it gives that's it that why they call it flavor. ezekiel bread that's not why it's because of all the other elements you're so silly no yeah no it's the other elements so that's interesting yeah, yeah so instead of so article? you know i always talk i always say you know ezekiel bread is not so bad just put some butter on it but for ezekiel instead of putting butter on it he had to spread dung on it I think it was baked in, but either way, it's still not good. Yes. I just Very thought I'd, well, I just I thought, know you're being funny. I just thought that was marginally amusing. Okay. <laughs> so it looks like nobody had anything to say about five, six, seven, five, six, and seven. So we'll go ahead and move on to eight here. Ezekiel eight. Sabrina Gilas, in this vision, Jehovah lets Ezekiel see many things, abominations that his people were doing in secret, even in the temple of the Lord. 8.10 says, So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Those creeping thing, these creeping things were reptiles or other rapidly moving animals according to Esord. Those people knew which animals were clean and which were unclean in the eyes of the Lord, so they had to know what and who they were serving and worshipping, right? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, well... Let's just say well, we know we, that they were doing rituals onto actual other gods in yeah. the temple of Jehovah. So, well, this this one in Israel must have been their their houses and their idols. It wasn't in the temple, right? The first one he shows them. No, is Israel, not Judah. Oh, the house of Israel. You're right. You're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but both then, were doing. Both. But later, right. later, yeah, later we hear about the temple. Yes, yeah. That's true. Jennifer Conley, Ezekiel. Uh, uh, let's see, Ezekiel eight three, and he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head 
and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north where was the where was the seat you see this is why I said it was past tense where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy and behold the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain then said he unto me son of man lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north so I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north and behold northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry what does the image of jealousy mean I believe it explains after that but there there was a woman statue that they had put right is my memory serving me right you want to look it up I'm looking it up right now. Eight, three. Yeah, uh, yes, which provoketh the jealousy. So, and he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of mine head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north where was the seat of the image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy. So, I, I, why am I having the idea? Maybe it's later on. There should be things that he brought in the inner courts of the house and the door of the temple in between the porch. This is 816 I'm reading. Five, 20 men, the backwards, the temple, Lord, the face is towards the east. And they worship the sun, so that's the east. I thought there was, an, I thought there was a statue of, of the woman. They always, you know, they always had this Astara thing. Uh, historically, too, there is. This is interesting. I don't okay, know so the know seat about. means the site. So it was just the site, place. Yeah. Where was the place or the site of the image of jealousy? So they must have had a statue, an idol. Right, that's what I'm saying. But there yeah. was. I thought I remembered reading. So I'm gonna have to find it, since uh, we, it would take us a while to read this. But I could have sworn there's a there's a statue, and it describes what the statue is. That's at that particular place. Yeah, here it is. Okay, thank you. Nathan was right. Ezekiel 8.14, my brain is not as numb as I thought it would be. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat the woman weeping from Tammuz. Remember that? For Remember Tammuz, reading this now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's that's the thing that brought God to his jealousy. So So she's, you, okay, so she's, she's facing the north. He brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. Yeah. And there's a woman weeping for Tammuz, and Tammuz was the statue then. Yes, but and it's the Phoenician. So basically, it's a Phoenician deity. And also, this, from from what research I, if this is totally by me, if I'm remembering this correctly, but there's also a, a statue that was made uh, where they, are you ready for this? She sat in a chair that was made with two wings of cherubims. Oh, goodness gracious. Ah, ah. And if you guys remember, what is the seat in the Holy of Holy have on it? Two cherubims with the wings. So, Oh, and um, Tammuz was the queen of heaven. That's what they right. were praying to uh, when they told yeah. Jeremiah, since we've been praying to the queen of heaven, everything's been fine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is the thing that really got God. And what was the thing they kept going back to over those 390 years? They kept building the Astara Garden. They Wait, kept no. building. No, I'm wrong what? about that. No, you're not. T they Tammuz, had Tammuz wasn't. Tammuz wasn't oh. the queen of heaven. Ishtar was the Ishtar was the queen of heaven. Yeah, Astara. And, and Tammuz yeah. was the eyes with was either her son or her consort, her lover. Oh. I, oh, I and that's why it was. A, but it was a statue weeping for Tammuz. It was a woman. No, a woman was weeping for Tammuz, like an actual I, woman. No, no, no. I'm going to read it, buddy. Listen. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward... Oh, you're right. And behold, there sat a woman weeping for Tammuz. Okay. I was under the impression it was a statue. Right. That's what the image was. So maybe the, what he meant was that there was a... I don't know. Okay. Yes. Good. See? Teamwork. Make that holy dream work. What? <laughs> So, um, yes, okay. 
it's the image a, it, of jealousy could be the image is a is the vision i don't know this is interesting though i can see this is where i thought there was a statue i'm glad that, that okay we real this. quick tammuz was the name of an ancient near eastern deity who was best known for his patronage of herdsmen and his romantic entanglement with inanna the sumerian goddess of sexual love also known as astarte or ishtar right uh, which is the one they always went to and yeah. built the gardens for as the groves yep yeah. as a fertility god he represented the insemination of the mother goddess as well as the production of healthy children the best known myth of tammuz describes his death at the hands of his lover a punishment earned for his failure to mourn adequately when she became lost in the underworld the god's sojourn among the dead was commemorated in various forms of human expression including poetic laments and ritual practice in this mm. in a syrian iteration tammuz was incorporated into the hellenic pan pantheon as adonis a beautiful youth who earned the love of aphrodite look at that guys all the pantheons have the same characters isn't that weird mm. the concepts of death and resurrection are tied to the myth of tammuz which I'm not going to read the rest of that because that's yeah. Wikipedia or whatever. And and basically also all the things that you think of satanic, like all the witchcrafty stuff where there's like a, a warlock man and then there he has like a, uh, what is it called? A, uh, what do they call them? The witches are make up a... Coven. The coven. coven. Thank you. Yeah, the coven. And then they would do a ritual uh, during the winter solstice, which is where, you know... There's the Halloween and Christmas stuff all ties into this, and they would make this uh, thing saying protect us in the winter, and then what we call Easter, Ashtara, Astro Day, uh, Easter, which is where they would decorate eggs, and they would make images of bunnies and male and female genitalia, and then they would place these things out in the grove and make an offering to the goddess so that she would make their livestock uh, healthy and flourish and and protect it so that uh, so they would have a lot of things so crazy. yeah so catriona i hope i got your name right is reminding me of something now i remember that name sounded familiar yes it had to do with semiramis and nimrod uh there was a religion that was created uh by i think semiramis who was the queen and uh there was a son and there was uh, at some point basically it became ritual sacrifice and it became, first of all it, it so this actually comes back to easter eggs oh my goodness if i remember correctly uh there was a um a ritual in which virgins were brought to the priesthood of this religion and mm -hmm. they were you know they the the priests had sex with the virgins and then the chat the children that were born from this were, were sacrificed yeah. and there were eggs made that were painted in their blood lovely right so yeah. this was actually going on um in israel uh and the beginnings of this religion go all the way back to nimrod and they've you know they de deified nimrod and deify and you know Semiramis deified herself and basically I think became Ishtar mm -hmm. and uh, holy moly you guys what a mess and, and if and if you do go back to this Nimrod as well had uh, uh, there is uh, artifacts as well that have this deity surrounded by cherubims yeah and and actually uh, uh, one of the other things that they did with Tammuz, the, who was an offspring, yes, they also made him into some kind of resurrecting son. So, mm -hmm. and I know you and I have talked about this before, and how the prophecies of the Messiah may have in, uh, may have been well known, especially to Noah and his sons, and mm -hmm. um, so to uh, you know to take that information and twist it and to apply it to oneself it was a uh, probably a tempting thing to do in the lands of egypt in the lands of babylon etc so yeah, and uh, syria and all those other areas yeah at the time so oh, so if, if we think of it if we think of it in that frame work that here is jehovah looking at a myth created by man trying to appropriate his prophecy and story would that mm -hmm. not provoke him to jealousy exactly 
nail on the head, brother. Nail on the head. If you, it, you're, you're taking his story and twisting it and making yourself the god or the or the, the deity, and then you're erasing God's story. <laughs> oh man, yeah. you're erasing God's story, and then you're doing all this. What we would call today satanic, which yeah. is what it is. Satanism is based off of this. All the Satan satanic rituals from even baby sacrifices to Baal and Moloch and things like that. So it's crazy. It's like, it's, we think of it as just like, uh, you know, maybe you guys don't, but you know, I, I perceive that when you, when most believers or Christians read these stories of the Bible about these things, they perceive like hippies, maybe with one of those, uh, what are they called poles where they're doing the ribbons and they do the fair and they have flowers in their hair and they're just being sweet and innocent, but they have little wooden statues. And it's just like, not a big deal. You know what I'm saying? But like, no, like they did really dark, creepy, you know, very uh, evoking other spirits, inviting demonic things and presences. They always sought power. They always wanted to make themselves greater. I mean, if you remember when they did the, you know, I know it's a kind of thing, but as Alex just explained, they just changed the names. Each culture took the same religion, the same faith, the same demonic presence, and just changed the name and then rewrote the story. Maypole. Thank you, Julie. Yes, the Maypole. You know, I feel like people just imagine that when they think of, like, Ashtara and the gardens and the groves and things like that. But, like, nah. As somebody who, who, who unfortunately, you know, participated in that really dark, new-agey, satanic stuff, at one point, you know, it's, it, it's way... And if you want to invoke power and be a warlock or like a witch or you want to be an oracle or you want to have the power in your life guiding you you know you you line up at the stars you do it on the solstice which is where these christian holidays came from and stuff like that and it's just like now when you start to put this stuff together guys it's like you don't need you don't need a pastor or a priest to tell you you know what what holiday to participate in right like i'm not trying to convict anybody but you know when you when you read these things and you read that millions of jews were basically killed you know over this period of time from the time that they arrived in the desert with moses to this moment with jeremiah and ezekiel millions you know and god gave them 390 years <laughs> and 40 years for judah I mean, he gave them a lot of time, 390 years back then. That's like how many generations? That's a lot of generations. And I mean, talk about an amazing amount of grace. So you, this is why also I feel like all the problems, and I know you guys have heard I'm taking a soapbox moment, forgive me. But this is why I believe that all the things that all of Christianity fights about is solved by reading the Bible. Because if Nathan Wheeler says, or Alex Lovovsky says, or yada yada famous pastor or televangelist or old school theologian says it becomes the he said they said they believe they decipher they found out but when you read these things for yourself in the scriptures and you realize how much it ticked god off and what he did because it provoked him to jealousy right to where he destroyed the temple and killed almost all of them you're like hmm I believe that the reader being moved by the Holy Spirit is going to be like, I don't know, I just got maybe a little conviction in me right now. And nobody can put that in you by just telling you, you know what I mean? And again, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to project any conviction on anybody, but I feel like it's a of natural course, when you Of course, you know, nobody's saying that a Christian who, who has celebrated Easter in the way that they may have celebrated it or Christmas in the way did it to serve Tammuz or the stupid myth that the Babylonians right. came up with. Nobody's saying right. that. We're saying that the little artifacts that have made their way through history, they go mm -hmm. back to that time. And they go back to those, I mean, those were their meanings at that time. Those aren't yeah. their meanings today, thank God. But those were their meanings then. And, right. and you know, for... It's just amazing that the one that the, that the faith system that the Jews or the Israelites couldn't break free from, it just kept popping up every other generation, right? Is the same one that made it into Christianity. It's just crazy to me personally. Yeah. Like it's like you you yeah. have to realize that there's something there. 
that, yeah. that you know many people say oh well there's no power in it well i don't know about that but it's not more power than god but there's definitely there's something about the fact that as you guys have read the bible with us here through this every other generation and then god you know kitty cornered them right so when judah was struggling with it israel wasn't when israel was struggling with it judah wasn't so there was always like one somebody that was like doing okay there's very few times where they both were screwed up right but and unfortunately this was one of those moments but it's just crazy to think that this same practice the decorating of trees for the winter solstice the evoking the dead and 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 recalling the dead and the painting of eggs and and sexual objects like bunny rabbits and of course we don't have male and female genitalia being a part of the modern day situation but it's just unbelievable that if 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 you think that spiritual warfare or in doesn't exist you, you would have to ask yourself why did this same faith system always end up being the one how come it wasn't valhalla how come it wasn't like you know i don't know why come it wasn't buddhism like what you know what i'm trying to say like why was yeah. it always the particular one that yeah. always so so michael Michael uh, Bilello, uh, mm -hmm. hope I got your name right. You say you disagree. Those meetings are exactly the same, but people are ignorant about what they idolize. When people the don't, when people don't understand yeah. a meaning, then the meaning isn't the same. So right. uh, a, a Christian who runs around and does Easter egg hunts with their church has no idea that the tradition of eggs on Easter is for Ashtara and Tammuz and child sacrifice. If they read the Bible, they may find that out, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. The, the point is not to, to, to claim that their sin is one of... Uh, uh, um, <laughs> on the caliber of what these folks uh, are On that doing? caliber, it is, it is, it is just, a, just a point of ignorance. The point is, once you know that though, once, once you know that those are the symbols and this is where their tradition comes from, it's gross. It should yeah, be I'm icky. Saying. It probably should be icky. Yeah. So this isn't about condemning. This conversation, taken out of context, is crazy. This isn't about condemning Christians uh, who have celebrated or continue to celebrate Easter egg hunt without any knowledge of the, what the symbolism mean. Uh, this mm -hmm. isn't about condemning them or claiming that they're, you know, <laughs> this isn't about... This isn't about trying to push convictions onto people, but we are discovering in the process of reading the Bible of OMG, this is where the imagery comes from. And now you can make your own choices about what you want to do about that. So, and, Michael, I get that for you, the choice is that stuff is blasphemy. Yeah. Get away from me for that stuff. I'm with you, Michael. I get it. We're on the same page. But, you know, give people a chance to get to that page is what I'm saying. And that was my point is that it's amazing that, you know, there's a lot of people even even in our, our groups here at Yeshua Network, as you guys have seen over the years of people saying, oh, well, you have to believe this, you have to do this, you have to know this knowledge. If you don't know this knowledge, you're not right with God, you're not saved, you know, so on and so forth. And I'm always like, from day one, I've always been like, people always go, how come you always telling people to read the whole Bible? I, you guys already know this, you know this, literally, you know this. Why, why are you always telling people to read the whole Bible? Why are you always telling people to read the whole Bible? It's like, um, because it's all there. And not only that, but like, it's one thing for, for me to hear from Larry, Moe, and Curly, right? Which are the three stooges, if you guys don't know where those names come from. Uh, Larry, Moe, and Curly about, you know, this stuff. But then, but then when I read it in the Bible, as we talked about earlier, how it's like a one pedal, two pedals, three pedals, and then you know, all the petals of the flower get revealed. And the amazing thing is, is as you read the Bible and you see God's grace, I mean, how many times have we all been told, I know we've talked about this, but how many times have we all been told by a non-believer that the God of the Bible is a mean kid with a magnifying glass or he's an egomaniac and he's just a bad, bad God that says, worship me or I'm going to smite you and send you to hell. But when we watch the revealing of the petals open up and we watch this flower of truth bloom as we read every book and every word we see the total opposite that this god is a god of grace and a mercy but also that he is a god that does get pissed and that he does pull blessing 
he does pull blessing away. He, he he's not always the fluffy hippie god that many of us in Christianity think. So you know, there, there's two lies being told that God is just this really fluffy God on the cloud that says, as long as you know my name, we're all good, do whatever you want, or you're already in the right with me. And then there's this non-believing God that is out to make every human grovel like a pharaoh in Egypt and, you know, worship them or be killed. You know, both of these stories are not true. You know, there's a balance and there's a reality of it. And uh, that's that's the reason for me pointing this out is is that I don't think there's a better way to bring somebody to have a, a closer heart to the truth of what God has given us uh, with his festivals, his, his freedom from even the mosaic Levitical uh, hindrances, right? And, and, and the new covenants that he's created, the two new covenants after the Mosaic Levitical laws were, were passed, the two new covenants, one with Jer the Jeremiah time period and one with Yeshua time period. It's just like you wouldn't even be able to have such a conversation with a, unfortunately, with an, an average day Christian believer. You, you wouldn't be able to talk about these things. You, you couldn't have this conversation. And so the only way to really bring, I believe, a body of Christ into a place where the body of Christ can have this conversation is that we all read the scriptures. And we should read it together as a fellowship as we're doing, but it should also be, uh, you know, we all read it and study it to find ourselves approved. And then we can we can really have this conversation. And it's not Ralph said, Jack said, Nathan said, Alex said, you know, John Piper said, John MacArthur said, Martin Luther said, John Calvin said. It's none of these things. It's the Bible said. Right. God himself and, said. And it should hopefully never that. really be you know alex said the bible said that's also no, not never. right it should no, always it should just hurt. be i read the bible and this is what it said Damn. there it is and okay. that's the only way to really know uh, it is uh, and and that is really literally all we're about you read the bible you out there we read the bible us over here and obviously, if you've gotten to this video recorded, <laughs> you've you've been reading the Bible. So bravo! But we are we are uh, we also want to encourage anybody as you do read the Bible and as you come to your convictions, as you've also heard me at least say a thousand times. So I'm saying it again. You know, when you give a testimony about your being changed by God's word and how you've decided to live a new way. In his way, you, you you've been told the 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 steps of what he calls us to to be and what he calls us to do and what he says matters most to him. And then you you study yourself and you stalk yourself and you take a good hard look at your actions, your thoughts, and 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 your motivations. And you say, what are, what what are these things that I'm doing that are not in line with God? When you give a testimony about the results of making that choice you have the power of God in your testimony, where if you just go around barking commandments at people, uh, you know, you're literally behaving as a Pharisee or a Sadducee did in the time where Yeshua walked, and he said, the father, uh, the devil is your father. And, and so are we, not to, are we not to encourage our brothers and sisters and show the truth? We are. The Bible says if somebody calls themselves brother or, or sister in Christ, you, it is your job to to gently come to them with with what you perceive as being uh maybe sin let's do, let's just go all the way to something sinful but at the same time you walking up and saying i say that what you're doing is sin is a lot different than you saying i want to give you a testimony after i read the bible after i read these passages i changed my ways this is how I changed them, and this was the result and the outcome of that change that I made. And I just want to encourage you that if you would like to have that same change or you would like to experience God in the same way, I'd like to encourage you to go to those scriptures, read them for yourself, as we do here at Yeshua Network, and then encourage them to be open to the experience that you had. And, and, and then when they have, when any human being has an experience, and me and Alex just got done talking about when a person has an experience with God themselves, good luck trying to convince them they did not just have that experience, right? There's no better way for somebody to believe in God than for 
them to experience God. And, and God says, those who knock, the door will be open. Those who seek, they shall find. You know, if you invite God in, he says, yes, thank you very much. I will come in. So, so I, I hope this is all making sense. I know I'm being long-winded. I know for those of you who have been around for a while, uh, you know, you've heard this a thousand times. But um, I don't think that this is, I think this is a message that we can never get tired of hearing, never get tired of reminding ourselves. Uh, because as we know from Scripture, knowledge puffs up ego. And as we do learn more of the scripture, as we do get more convictions, that's good. But it also means that we should also remember where we all came from. I have celebrated many Christmases. I have celebrated many Easter's. I have celebrated many Halloween's. Uh, <laughs> LA is like Halloween central. So, you know, uh, we should also not be throwing stones in a glass house and forget where it is that the Lord has brought us out from. Right. So exactly. that's why I think just, exactly. just testimony, exactly. testimony. Is because just if you go from so, if you go from zero to if you in conversation, if you go from zero to, oh, yeah, you're worshiping, you know, sacrifice children and the eggs and the blood and the da 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 da. It's mm -hmm. it's uh, you know, you 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 may have <laughs> the like you, you well, you may have the opposite effect of that which you intend to have. That's just, Absolutely. you know, but if the Lord moves you. To say exactly that, then please, yes. by no means am I All saying don't say it. Uh, I yes. just simply am saying, you know, we, ha you know, <laughs> I think you get what I'm saying. Um, uh, Catriona, I just want to thank you for bringing that up and reminding us about the Tama story. Um, and, and, and I'm going to read your comment here. Absolutely. And it was learning about the roots of it all, the ancient mystery schools and Nimrod and Semiramis that brought me to my conviction and salvation last year. I already knew about the Jesuits and the Catholic paganism worshipping falling angels. I never knew that I never knew what I was worshipping and contacting in paganism, pantheism and New Age. I will never have anything to do with anything pagan or occultist ever again. It's all inherently Luciferian. Praise Yehua, Yehovah, for his grace and mercy. Amen, Catriona. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I, this isn't a plug or an endorsement of anything or everything that this man does. I don't know his material enough to, to do anything like that. Plus, it's not even about that or endorsements or anything like that from anybody. I just want to say that. But I remember seeing a good video, an interesting video about the subject by Michael Rood. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube that talks about... Mm this particular period having to do with Tammuz and the eggs and the horrible stuff. And if you're interested to find out more, Michael Rood, YouTube. Okay. Amen, brother. <laughs> Good stuff. Yep. Praise the Lord. Good conversation, guys. Yeah. This is what it is. It's a fellowship. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, Sabrina, 8-6, thou shalt see greater abominations. So like I understand it, in the order that the Lord let Ezekiel see all these things, that were going on in those places. There is a uh, gradation, a graduation of abominations. The image of jealousy is a smaller abomination than worshiping the creepy and unclean beast. And their one is smaller than the woman who were weeping for the god Tammuz. The last abomination that Yah Yahweh showed to Ezekiel is the biggest one of these who are in, the, in these verses to worship the sun. So Jehovah showed Ezekiel in an increasing degree of horribleness. We know that all those gods and idols are really demons. And Yahweh is, the in this way, telling us the graduation or ranking on which demon is bigger than another. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if we should give the credit. I think there should. there's probably definitely a hierarchy to demons. But, um, I mean, there is scripture that kind of lends to that, of course. Uh, but I think that I'm under the persuasion, this is Nathan Wheeler, under the persuasion that the worshiping of the sun, it's because the worshiping of the sun came and went, and it was basically, it was, I believe it started in Samaria and then it moved to Egypt. And when you worship the pharaohs, uh, Ramsey II actually, uh, along with, uh, oh, I can't remember their names, you know the name, Khufu, Kuf I think it was. Kafu, yeah, Kafu. he, um, they, they declared themselves um, the worshippers of the suns, which is what the Sphinx is, which is a lion with wings and things like this, and a man's head on it. Kind of sound familiar. I mean, you're taking body parts and stuff, and I know that that was kind of before this, but you know, they took these symbols that 
that God had chosen to represent himself and then to have the people that God brought out of Egypt with the parting of the sea and then Moses and the staff and Aaron and then he gives them the temple and the, and the king that they asked for and the nation that he promised unto them and then they bring those gods of Egypt and Samaria into not just God's territory but literally into the temple and I, I, I'm, I'm under the persuasion that, that through all this that's the real insult is it's the fact that like you know this whole pinnacle moment for Judah specifically let's just say Judah in Israel is the Moses moment it, it's the pinnacle moment he is he is you know as God said you are me on earth he said that to Moses and for that individual in that moment in time to be brought full circle in the negative to where the worshiping of the sun god was in his temple in Jerusalem I'm under the persuasion that that's why it's the bigger I, I don't know if I would give personally credit to the fact that it's a bigger demon but more of that it's a bigger it's just forgive bigger, my phrase it's just a bigger it's a bigger pile insult of it's just it's a bigger pile of poop. I mean I mean it's just such an insult of what he's done for them and it's also and, an insult to you know it's an insult to his chosen his chosen prophets it's an insult to Moses it's yeah, a, it's exactly. just such a big poo poo caca pardon my French <laughs> Woo. You, you potty mouth, get it? Poo poo caca potty mouth. Caca, potty mouth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's that, that's why I'm under the persuasion of it is is the sun god and, and how it yeah. how it stems from those places. So, but it, it could be it could be other things. Like there, there, is, could, there is it also could be that they were doing other things in that worshiping that would also be really bad. To so. to God, there is no hierarchy of demons that he would really get irked about, in my opinion. Right. I mean, Satan is the, obviously the king of the. S S Satan of is the life. one that Satan is the two. Uh, point being that we're. Yeah. <laughs> point being, I'm not gonna make I, that point. That I'm. Just I just think to make. it's more personal. I don't think yes. it's credit to the demons. Exactly. I think it's more That's what I'm to trying to say. Yeah. With their culture and those people, yeah. So yeah. yeah. If, if. Exactly. They place their right after Exodus. They place their uh, they they created the golden calf. Mm -hmm. uh, right. You know, it's it doesn't really matter what the represent representation is. It matters what is it replacing and how is it replacing and when is it replacing. And it goes against what he literally told them to do. Yes. Forty days yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just like you're saying, the worshiping of the sun god inside the temple or in the temple compound. Can't, you can't you can't get any full circle slap in the face yeah. than that the entire culture the entire nation of Israel is defined by Exodus and by the laws of Moses and for yeah. it to come full circle and adopt the religion of any country let alone Egypt oh you a come on now yeah. exactly things, are, things have fallen Ezekiel have fallen. nine nine three through four give me hope oh, this is Ann Sumner's uh, gives me hope with the man dressed in white linen yes indeed i agree all right you want to read the next one brother sabrina oh wh wh white linen what happened where we're we're in nine we finished the last one of eight oh oh the man dressed with white linen four. yeah <laughs> yeah obviously oh he's Symbol. the one he's the yeah he's the one that 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 put the name of god on people's foreheads mm -hmm. right is that mm -hmm. right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he, he put yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then he says, if they're if it's on them, their foreheads, then they won't be touched. Right. Mm -hmm. Sabrina Gilas nine four. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that had that be done in the midst thereof. This reminds me about what's going on in Revelation at the time. People also will get marked, get a seal or signature. And I also remember the mark Jehovah gave to Cain in Genesis 4.15. Uh, then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. This mark, seal thing, that keeps coming back and is happening since the beginning of time, it seems, is, is the letter Tav, which has the symbol of a... is the letter Tav, which has the symbol of a cross. So everyone who will not get hurt, who will get Jehovah's seal and mark, will be a cross. So interesting. The enemy is a counterfeiter and is also going to use a mark or a seal or sign to make people uh, to make the people 
to mark the people who follow and serve him. That'll be something else than Tav. In uh, 9.2, we read about a man dressed in linen. This man really drew my attention. Who is he? Because he is the one that was giving those people the mark, this mark or sign. There are six others. This man in linen is number seven, apart and different from the others. Daniel also saw him in a vision, and his description is as follows. Daniel 10.5, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen, with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. To me, it sounds like a description of how others describe Yeshua himself. So this man in linen could be Yeshua. Any thoughts? <laughs> well, not not only do I, I believe and can persuade it, it's Yeshua, which is the manifestation of God in human form, Yehovah in human form. But did anybody notice that all those things are exactly the same symbolisms that we saw in, or that are we are told about in Ezekiel? Yeah. Right? All the exact same things. Fire, lightning, topaz. Well, the topaz, I guess, is maybe a little different, but the uh, the, brand, the bronze, you know, just like all these things are like, Mm, interesting same exact kind of things right and so and then also we know that uh when they see him in revelations he has fire in his eyes and also i just want to point out something because it was brought up in this in this reading here about tav uh the the, the last letter of the hebrew alphabet which is a symbol of a of a of a cross um also tav means though light and that's very interesting because in the book of Revelations, in chapter 22, it talks about how uh, they won't need candles anymore because the name of the Lord will be on their foreheads and it will radiate light. So light in of itself is also Jehovah's name. So it's a very interesting thing. And in the old days, if you guys don't know, like, so Jews won't say the word Jehovah, like, we do here on Yeshua Network, they will say Adonai or Elohim or, uh, you know, other words, uh, trying to, Shaddai, uh, Hashem, things like this. They'll, they'll use other words to reference Yehovah, but uh, they'll, they'll say Yehovah, not Yahweh. Um, so my point is, is to say that what they would also say throughout the, the, these periods that we've been reading is they would refer to God with just the word Tav. And anybody would know that when somebody would use the word Tav by itself, as we also think of Yah, but Tav was more the casual use. So as we say the word God, they would use the word Tav. Uh, and I think that's also fascinating, too. So Abba Father, thank you, Michael. Yeah, that's another one. So just, just another thing that when you think of a cross on the forehead or Tav on the forehead, you will think of a cross, but also Tav means light. So what if there was an emanating light, which is what Revelation 22 talks about? Read it for yourself, you'll see. But of course, we'll get there and all these things will tie together. I just thought I'd throw that in now. So, just so, so I'm totally with you on all of this. So I just want to track where, Sab I, I agree, this, this, this sounds right to me, is my point. But I want to track where Sabrina, where Sabrina, you, you, you get that the mark and seal is a Tav. It's in the re Revelation. Oh, it's in Revelation that it says it's a Tav? Well, it says that it, that it's light. Oh, okay. And tav so is light in Hebrew. I got you. So she I, might, I see. She might, that's why I'm going into the extra detail of telling you. Uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay. I see. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. That makes perfect sense. Um, very, very cool, you guys. Um, Yeah, see, the more symbolism, like the, these symbolism things, they're not just cool Harry Potter, Lord of the Ringsy things, right? No, they're like, very there's specific. so much. There's, yeah, it's very specific. Like all these things are very specific. And I do believe that as we get through the Bible and we continue to read that as we have, we will continue to have an understanding of these symbols. Because they, they, trust me, especially once we get into Daniel, guys, I, I feel that Daniel is a turning point in the Bible. I feel like, like right now, as we're in, Jer in Ezekiel, like everything has been building up obviously to Moses then from Moses we kind of learn about God's people how he interacts with people and then we get to Daniel and I feel like the whole Bible changes gears and I know that for some of you you've read already up you know further into the, in the scriptures but once you read Daniel and you're like 
okay, there's something, as, as we feel Ezekiel has been different than the folks before, and Moses was obviously different than the folks before, Daniel obviously is a guy who's different than the folks before, and, and I feel like everything kind of turns gears at that point, and, uh, and then of course you get to New Testament, everything changes gears again. So it, but it's, it's, it, I just, I'm excited to get to Daniel, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And I think that anybody who right now, who's maybe feeling a little confused or that you don't understand these symbolisms, don't worry, they're going to be brought up a lot more and we will definitely be going into them more as they get revealed. Cause then it tells us what their meanings are. The Bible actually will reveal to us their applications and points and things like that. Yeah. And if, if, just, if just to if, encourage people, if what we're, you know, if what's being talked about here, take the next take another little tidbit here is tav a representative of the seal so light uh mm. light having to do with the essence or even the name of god himself uh well when you worship the sun what are they doing they're worshiping the artificial light that god put exactly. in place put in place to you know perform a Replace function himself. so the sun is a tool that the lord yeah. created to perform a function and um and so by worshiping the artificial light and giving it a deity uh yeah. again mass obviously massive idolatry and and a total um uh, you know provokes to jealousy sort of thing yes and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because if we're on this point we might as well just complete it as well so when god created let's call it the universe right he was the light and then he created the sun so he didn't basically have to be the light anymore the right. sun is actually artificial light and yeah. what's crazy is is that when he comes back and he destroys the world he as yeshua yeshua the manifestation of yehovah the symbol of tav the cross so yehovah yeshua the one who died on the cross tav is written as a cross meaning light christ himself is on earth as the light he is the light source <laughs> so god once again is the light source of the world just yeah it, and this all gets explained so it, it's it's awesome it's so awesome have i ever told you guys how much i love the bible <laughs> <laughs> oh it's amazing yeah. really good stuff guys okay and sumner 11 i think this uh, one's you brother is it, you or is it, me? Uh, it doesn't matter let me let's just do okay. it in chapter 11, the description of the secret places in the temple really depressed me. The leaders must have hidden their idolatry from the people, and it seemed to worsen with each layer, Ezekiel saw. So disheartening how Jehovah must have felt to see such unholiness. Yeah, exactly. Sabrina Gailas, huh? Well, just real quick, and, and from people that he probably perceived as, you know, their leaders, right? right. Like that's their, this is their holy, good people. These are the people who lead them and intercede for them on Yom Kippur every year, right? And if you're thinking to yourself, well, if you're not atoning for the people as you're supposed to be doing, then that means all the people have not had their sins atoned for. And that's that means that like you and your family are spiritually in trouble with the Lord because those priests didn't do what they were supposed to do. You know, that's there's there's a whole reality too that as as those of us as Christians, we don't have and and on that note if you think about the the danger of this this one human who goes in on on the day of atonement and atones for the entire body of believers um and then you hear yeshua say i'm the high priest i'm the good high priest i am the sacrifice like he not only makes sure that the sacrifice is done for all of us he is the sacrifice and then when you hear him say the sentence you know or, or you hear him declared as by the apostles, especially that he is the he is our high priest, and we don't have to ever wonder or ever worry if it was ever done with mistake, if there was ever anything said in the temple, or he had a, a string loose, or he, I don't know, maybe hiccuped in the middle of, a, of the Shema. You know what I mean? Like, we don't have to worry about any of that stuff because we have the perfect high priest. We have the perfect you know, just the perfect high priest. It's just, uh, it, it means a lot more when you are reading these passages and right. you're understanding what these high priests did in the temple yeah. and what the fear, what the fear there in could be now that we perceive that somebody may have been a bad high priest. Ooh, right, and there were, I mean? there were some bad high priests. Yeah. Uh, right. And, 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 yeah, that's actually a very, really important point. 
the function that the high priest performed wasn't just a, uh, a know, ritual. It wasn't just a ritual that he had to do. And no, no, like the system worked. If he did it, then the then if he did it right, and everything was done by by the book, mm -hmm. the sins were forgiven. Mm -hmm. People received a new spiritual slate, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. And and his function was to do that. Um, if he didn't do it, then then the sins are not, you know, then the no. sins stay on the, on the nation. But but and just to give super clarity too, because this is often a thing. When we think of sins, we think of damnation or salvation. But but these days of atonement, God could not understand this. God wanted to bless his people and protect his people. And because these things weren't done or because bad things were done, God couldn't bless the other people. He couldn't bless the innocent. He couldn't give the apple a, a, a year of, of no corrosion. He couldn't give the crop an abundance of wheat. He ha it all was dying and corroding and there was suffering and there was degradation because these these leaders were not doing what he had commanded them to do. And that's devastating to think about, you know, if, if you thought to yourself, my kid's not going to eat or my kid has a disease because the guy who tells me every year that he's going into the temple and atoning for me and my family and my grandchildren and their grandchildren and he's not doing it. And you realize that the disease your child has or the suffering and the famine that your child has is because this person's not doing their job. And you're like, I did my part. I gave up our last goat. I gave up our last penny. I donated or I gave my last tithe. And, and it took my, food out of my child's mouth. Or I, And, you know, I'm going to go this far because this is another thing that Christians don't normally think of, guys, is remember, too, that when you couldn't pay a debt, your children got taken from you and became slaves. And the reality is that we learn from the Bible is that some of them became sex slaves. And this is the this this ties in with where Matthew in the future, when we get to Matthew and he's a tax collector, this is this is why everybody hates him so much because tax collectors tricked people and put more debt on them so that they couldn't, so that they could grab their kids. That that's that's the real bad part of a tax collector. We'll get but if you think about it too, if you're doing your part and you are tithing and you are trying to do your best, and even though you're making mistakes, but you're doing the atonement stuff, and then you find out that the priest doesn't even take the atonement and offer it to God, but instead offers it to Molech or Ashtar or the Tammuz or Baal. And then, and, and could you imagine like now when you read the passages we just read here in nine, where it says those who lament for the sins, those who are, are ripping their clothes and, and, and crying over the fact that this has all been done. Now the weight of this whole thing, the reality, there's so much more of a reality when you, when you understand what was really going on with the, with the lives of these folks and how I'm going to give up my last morsel of bread to make sure that I donate to the temple. My kid and I are not going to eat for a week, but I want to make sure that the blessing of God comes upon me. And I'm sitting here believing, I'm sitting here believing that God's going to bless me and then maybe that blessing doesn't come. Now we all sit here and we read these scriptures and we think to ourselves, how is it that the children of Israel got to the point where they would even begin to start worshiping other gods? Because if the leadership wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, God would not be blessing them the way he promised he would. They would do their part, not get the blessing that was promised and think exactly what the scripture tells us. They said, God has fallen asleep and he doesn't even know we're here anymore. So now you understand that the, the, the leadership, you know, the Levites who, when we were reading Moses, were like, well, these people are super special and they got chosen to be these people that interact on behalf of God and stuff. And they were, I'm not, I'm not making fun in my tone. I'm saying like they were, they were special, but then also the weight on their shoulders that they carried on behalf of the entire nation of Israel, when they mess up, they are the reason also in, in, in this that God's blessings don't come, and that causes people to do as people do today. Where's your God? Oh, yeah, how come my kid has cancer? Oh, yeah, how come my family is starving? Where's your God? Right? And, and just like people today, people back then, 
they weren't educated. Nobody gave them the full truth. Nobody explained to them why God's hand or blessings were upon them. And so they blamed God and didn't understand that there was a solution because they didn't educate themselves. You know what I mean? It's, it's amazing. It's really just and now I think I just want to point that big, long thing out because I think it gives a more fullness to how this thing unraveled, what the point of a priest and the Levitical, you know, tribe were and what the importance of it. And then again, when we hear when we hear the apostles say you have a high priest in him, what a totally different weight, especially knowing that all this got destroyed because of bad leadership, you know, and, and people following yeah. false gods. It, and it, stuff. it tells you that if you turn to this high priest, he will do the job right. Exactly. He will never let you down and he will always keep your word. And what does he say? I will not forsake you. Oh, come on. <laughs> See, it has a whole different weight, right? You could never just explain that to somebody if they hadn't read all the passages up to this yeah. point. And of course, there's so much more to come when we get to the New Testament that when we hear these passages again, they're going to have even more weight to them. And, and, and it's not something you can't explain. It has to be read in its entirety, I feel, to get the weight of it. I agree. All right. Uh, Sabrina Gilas, 1113. And it came to pass when I prophesied that uh, Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died. Wow. Talk about a quick result of the word of the Lord. Yep. <laughs> And then finally, uh, last comment here, Sabrina Gilas, 11, 19, and 20. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh, and they may walk in my, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Amen and hallelujah. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit to be inside of me and with me all the time that I am his and he is mine. <laughs> Little Ryan. Little Ryan. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right, you guys. Well, that's today's video with Ezekiel 1 through 12. It was a long video, as I think we all uh, anticipated, but I hope it was a good one, and I hope it was a blessed one, and, and I'm sure there's going to be many more questions and comments. That's why we got next week's video. We're going to do another 12 passages, so it'll be 13 through, what, 14, 15? Is that right? 14. What? So, yeah. Huh? I'm just telling them what passages to read next week, the next 12. 13 through 24. Oh, yeah. What's wrong with me? I just said 12. Oh, my goodness. 13 to 14. I meant 24. My brain is. You guys get what I'm saying. I yes. know. Don't look at me like that. Anyways, we love you. Yeshua loves you. And we hope that you guys are blessed by this. We're so blessed by your we hard work you. and all your effort, you guys. Thank you so much for all that you do. It yeah. really blesses us. It's a huge fellowship. blessing, not just for us, huge. guys. There's uh, there's people out there in the world watching these videos and reading the Bible with us, and it's amazing. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Be blessed. And be the blessing. Always. Be the light, guys. Shine that light of the Lord. <laughs>